Hello, this is Silas here, and we're back with my friend Steven. Say what's up, Steven. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. This is our series called I Know Great People, and it's just one where we have conversations with people. And thank you for taking part in this, both guys, gals, and everybody else in between listening to this. And my intention with this series is to share information about what people do versus what we think they do. And my hope in this is to kind of bridge the gap between perception and knowledge, because I believe that the more we know about ourselves, the greater the things we can accomplish. And ourselves as human beings, we are a globalized society, I think, whether you like it or not. And pretty much everything we do is an appropriation of taking on conversations and passing on this long stream of knowledge and existence. And we learn from what other people do. And we can also give back to the rest of the world and pass that knowledge on. And I've benefited a lot from that. And this series is just one of the ways that I'm able to do this through conversations with friends and people that I know. And Stephen's been along with me on this. And we have somebody on here today for, I think, third part in this series. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just ask you, open with the first question. And what is your name, the occupation, pastime um, that we're, that's going to be the subject of this questionnaire, this conversation? And how do the two of you know each other? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, my name is Laura Milnes, and I live in Toronto, um, Ontario, Canada. Um, and I am, I guess, what you would call a wine consultant. I don't really even know or I haven't really settled on the name because I do kind of like a myriad of different things. Um, so I moved to Toronto a couple of years ago, and then I saw an opportunity to start doing wine tastings. Um, and we'll probably get into the whole reason why Canadians are not well-versed on their own industry. Um, and so that took off for me. And then from there, it just sort of snowballed into all these other opportunities. So then I started a wine club, which is called Crushable. And I have a business partner who I run that with, and he's located on the opposite coast in British Columbia in one of the wine regions, um, that we promote a lot called the Okanagan Valley. Um, and then I also have my own website where I do a lot of freelance writing, um, and I have an online shop. So I'm like, yeah, I'm a little bit of a Jack of all Jill of all. Um, mm. but it all kind of like funnels in <clears throat> to each sort of, um, endeavor really kind of like seamlessly. Um, like when I do my tastings, I promote the wine club and then people join and, uh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say Silas though, I really love that opening and I'm definitely going to steal that an appropriation <laughs> of stream of knowledge. That's incredible. Mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Let's definitely do that. That's, that's part of what this series is about. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Steven, how did the two of you, how did you meet? Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you originally <laughs> followed me. What was funny? Well, what was funny was I think you, you originally followed me and I thought you were just like another like restaurant industry person or something, but you were in that group chat that I was in with um, some of our mutual friends. And I think you liked stuff I posted or something. And then I'm trying to remember if you followed me and then you joined the group ch chat or it was the other way around, but then we just, we started talking more directly and via zoom and all. So that was that. I don't know. Well, what was that? I Maybe like in, I slid into your DMs and I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like trying to suss you out. I'm like, what's this guy deal? He's super aggressive with his opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works. I'm, trying, I'm, I'm trying to remember how long ago this was now. That was just like, um, probably like six months ago. Yeah. It sounds about Maybe right. Maybe more. Yeah. 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 And then now we talk all the time and like, I get yeah. like, a million voice notes from Steven. I'm like, oh, <laughs> got to listen to these 25 voice notes now. <laughs> That's one of the things that um, i trying to explore in this because a lot of situations people will talk about how they don't really know somebody unless you meet them. But then from my experience, I know a lot of people who are physically around people but can feel completely alone with that person. Yet some people can, you can meet somebody online, even though online you could technically make up an own, your own personal your own personality your own individuality you can make up an avatar we're getting to the point where they have like the deep fakes you could have an entirely different person's face but you can still make a lot of connections through that because the amount of communication and sharing of ideas in some aspects maybe even not being that person can free you up to actually communicate certain parts about yourself that you might not be able to do if you first met in person like you're saying like which is his aggressive nature like where in public would he be able to just openly speak in the mean, in the means that he was speaking on that social on Instagram by posting those things? And there's few and far in between, I think, those kind of places. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I was yeah. I was just gonna I was just gonna add to that. It's funny because one <clears throat> one of the guys who I met at the party last night was saying how like I was way more reserved in person than like I am online. But I'm like, well, there's two things with that because one online it's more of like a public forum where I just post my opinions, and also like in in a group I'm kind of different because like I try to listen to other people and stuff. Whereas like one on one, like Silas and I get in depth, you and I get in depth, Laura. But like in a group of people, I tend to be more someone who kind of like listens and goes along. I mean, it's just like. I don't know. That's why I guess I just prefer like conversations like this or like one on one. I'm not a big fan of these like huge group discussions where you can't actually discuss anything in depth. It's just not really. Yeah, my it's thing. challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of on the the avatar thing, though, Silas, um, when I was in B.C. a couple of weeks ago, I met with a whole bunch of different winemakers. And this one, um, his name is Laurent and he's Italian and Belgian, speaks like five plus languages. And he was kind of talking about how. Um, with respect to like maybe your online persona or your in-person persona or like your work persona, um, that also applies with respect to different languages. And so when you're learning a new language, he said, it's almost like you go back to this childlike version of yourself because you have such a limited sort of vernacular to draw from. So you become almost more yourself when you're learning a new language. And I had never heard anybody describe it that way before. And I thought that was so fascinating. And I think it's so true because I speak French very poorly um, but because my sort of repertoire that I'm drawing from is so limited, I, I can't be as expressive or verbose as I am mm. in English. Right. So it's, I thought that was so cool that yeah. you brought that up very kind of like poetic almost. Yeah. Like I, I thought when I was <laughs> learning German, my German's not great, but like what I know it's interesting. Cause they have a lot of words that are like compound words that don't translate easily in English. So like, um, <clears throat> My friend Edward was reading uh, Friedrich Nietzsche in the original German, and he speaks German, I guess, fairly well. But he was saying he feels like it's lost in the English because it's like you have to translate things in such a way that there's not like a verbatim translation where it sounds like smooth. No, I thought that was very yeah, interesting. Yeah. Totally. That's, that, is, that is a good point. And yeah. that's the thing I wonder with avatars. Like people online, when they talk with elite speak or LOL, you know, if somebody writes something, they'll say something and they'll put LOL at the end. I'm like, are you really laughing out loud? But <laughs> online, <laughs> that would be the kind of way people speak. Like people will speak a certain way online and in person. But that whole idea of learning a new language. And yeah, that's that could be true because you need to break yourself down, go down to base meanings and build back up. And I think there's also that aspect of, do you really know a language? This is what has happened with me sometimes. I know... Apparently, I knew fluent French when I was five, but when I was like four, but then I forgot it. And then I tried learning it again when I was in, in like, uh, in the end of right before high school, in the first year of high school as well, but it didn't come back to me. And then I went to Italy and I was trying to learn Italian. And then the French started coming back to me. And I don't know if that was tied with ways or <laughs> the childhood and stuff, but just that whole aspect of trying to learn something, a different way to communicate, but when does it get to the point when you truly are that new person or when you speak languages? I don't know if this happens with you when you're trying to, when you're hearing another language, you're hearing French, does your mind get to a point where it understands it as French or is there always a point where it will translate it into English or into a stronger language? Like when does that bridge come? Is that when you become like a separate, as there's a separate French Laura out there that understands everything in French and there's a separate French, like English Laura out there that understands everything in English. Like where is the transition? And that's, that's kind of an interesting thing to think of. I think it's, yeah, it's, it, I think it's like an effortless thing where, where you're literally just thinking in that language. That's when whatever that persona may emerge. And I don't know, maybe I'm a more passive, shy, like archetypally feminine version of me in in French. I don't know. I don't know. Cause I used to be fluent when I was a kid and it's like flicking a light switch where it was just like, you could switch back and forth, you know? Um, but yeah. I just, I've lost it. Sadly that what's that adage, you don't use it, you lose it. And that couldn't be more true. And I'm trying to like read more and listen more, but I'm at that crux where it's like, it's so difficult. It's so like mentally draining and taxing to like pick it up yeah. again. But I feel like the more you do that, the more you can kind of like acquire more languages. Cause I think what, what you were saying about Italian, I think French and Italian, they're both romance languages, aren't yep. they? Yeah. Like they're very yeah. related. Yeah. yeah. So it's yep. like, you can kind of like, that's why I think you meet so many Europeans that can speak like six languages. Cause they're so, there's so yeah. many commonalities. So. 
Yeah, yeah like I, I can I can read some things in Dutch. <clears throat> like what I what I what limited I know in German. If I see cer certain things written in Dutch, I'll know what they say because they're close enough. But if I were to hear them speak it out loud, like it would be harder for me. I think. But like I see the words yeah. on paper. Same thing with Spanish. Like I see Spanish. Like I see how the words look similar to the French words. Like maybe there's like a U E instead of an O, and I'm like, okay, that in French it's this. But again, if I hear them speaking like rapid fire, I, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking like the French, yeah, French, Italian, and Spanish. There's a lot of crossover between between yeah. those three languages. Um, yeah. But you were saying we talked about also just being in person. You talked about your more feminine nature. The whole like sliding into the DMs thing that you mentioned that is something that men, men more do more often. But do you think that's something that's probably more comfortable for women to do in in the actual like online space? Whereas if how many people in person have you met where you were the first person to initiate the actual conversation, to initiate the friendship? What what began the actual seed of the friendship? Um, I'm very, I don't want to use the word aggressive because that has a negative <laughs> connotation, even though I described Steven as such, but <laughs> um, I'm, I don't know. I would say I'm quite domineering. Like I'm, I'm always the first person to start interactions because um, it just works. Like, I think a lot of people um, get trapped in their own anxiety and it sort of becomes this like perpetuating thing. Now I just sort of approach people and I have no qualms whatsoever, whether it's men or women. And even when I was single, um, when I was using like dating apps and stuff, I would always initiate conversations because it's just um, a game of numbers. It's like, you got to just... <laughs> throw the spaghetti at the mm. wall and see what sticks yeah. like no hard feelings if people don't like you i mean it is what it is and that's why i i was curious about steven i was like okay i hadn't seen anybody be that forthright with their political opinions and so i was like i wanted to see the man behind the uh proverbial mask so oh, and, not and, what and i was I expecting <laughs> and, and and I re and I remembered too um, when I posted wine. Finally, you were like, "I'm confused by this pick." I'm like, "Why?" You go, "Cause it's not politics." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, what was I? I'm forgetting something. I was going to ask. I, it might come back to me. Um, okay. With with this situation, with this, I know great people. I'm thinking like the connections of people. Like now that you mentioned someone like Laurent. Like, it'd be interesting now to see, like, okay, now that if we'd mentioned him, imagine, like, later on, you come on and we have a conversation with Lon, and then every time something or some person is brought up, that would be, like, something that can kind of branch off into that person. Like, oh, you mentioned Lon, then there's a talk with Lon people can go to. So with someone like Lon, how did y'all first meet? Like, was that something, are you a different kind of person when you're in work mode, in one? I'm in wine individual. I don't know what, what you want to call this thing, but there's certain personas where somebody will be in a certain position where they're focused on something and that will take away those, that apprehension that most people have. And I was listening to something with Free Domain Radio, like with Stefan Molnier, the philosopher, and he was talking about how someone asked him about shyness and he said this really excellent thing about it. He said, shyness isn't a thing about self-consciousness. It's actually something that's selfish because it's, you're keeping yourself, you're keeping your true self away from the people who you claim to care, that you claim to care about and people that care about you. So getting over that shyness and getting out there and putting yourself out there, especially in these relatively safe kind of environments, like an online space, what's going to happen? So I'm just going to type some words at you and hurt your feelings. Eh, big whoop. You still have the people in your world, but you still have people using social media in such a very closed off, careful, um, triggered by this kind of way where I'm like, that's not the purpose of this. This should actually no. be able to free us out in a different way. So do you personally feel like when you're in work mode, in focused in this in industry kind of areas, meeting people in something that you're very familiar with, does that change your openness or your ability to just meet and talk to people? Um, so this was something that I struggled with for a long time. Like I've been in the wine industry since I was 24. So like 14 years. Mm -hmm. And I was always trying to like fit into a specific mold or like an off the rack approach that you're supposed to get your sommelier certification and then you're supposed to work in a restaurant and then you're supposed to do these competitions and you know, X, Y, Z like recipe. Um, and I, it just never felt authentic. Um, and I'm very vocal about this now, even though I wasn't for a long time, cause it was a lot of skeletons in my closet. I got fired from like every job that I had in the wine industry. And it, it was just this like burden that I was carrying. Cause I was like, what's wrong with me? And like, I remember the last time I got fired, I called my therapist and was like, I need an emergency session. Like, what is wrong with me? Do I need shock treatment? Like what's going on? And she was like, you're just not a good employee. Just go and be an entrepreneur. She's like, you have the exact skill set that is 
you know, destined for like the self-employed. And so I did that. And then just through trial and error and a lot of failures, obviously, um, I learned to not be afraid of them. And then just realize that like, there doesn't need to be a difference. Like, because when I had put on this like business persona, it is just not really who I was. It was me behaving in a way where I, how I thought I was supposed to behave. Um, and I think that's why people think the wine industry isn't so innately pretentious and intimidating because it's very like upper crust and stiff and, you know, all of this stuff. And so once I just really tapped in to just who I was and embraced every aspect of my personality, like, obviously I still have moments where it's like, Oh my God, I'm so cringe. But the more I am myself, the easier and more effortless my business becomes. And through that, I've been able to build really phenomenal relationships with, especially the winemakers, because that's really who I want to talk and learn from. Um, the more I am myself, the more like I, I just build the most amazing relationships. And these people have all become my friends now. And so it's like, you can sit around a dinner table. Like that's what we did with Laurent until like the wee hours of the morning and passing a joint around and just like getting to like the meat of the person. It's like, that's where like the magic lies. And so I don't, I don't know, maybe for some people that's crossing boundaries and mixing two things that you shouldn't. But for me, that's, that's really what I predicate my whole business on. And like my business partner is one of my closest friends as well. Like I'll call him at midnight and talk to him until two in the morning about what's like going through my head. So yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was just going to add, I've struggled with this too, working front of the house and restaurants, especially, especially from a manager's point of view, because I mean, it is a customer service job and the restaurant's reputation's on the line and you have to defuse certain situations. And like, like, oh, there's a lot of stuff that I post that like, I won't say, like, I would never say in person at my job. And like, it was funny because certain people saw my posts and they were surprised, but I'm just like, you realize like I'm, ho- I hold back at work because I don't want to get fired or, you know, someone yeah. to start something, you know, that's all it is. If, if, if there were no consequences, I would just say everything I think, but it's, that's the world we live in now, unfortunately. So just have to deal with it. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really relate to that because per- personally with me, I have, there's, there's something odd about this relationships in general, this apprehension people get into like that whole shyness, that whole keeping themselves from each other, where even just in romantic relationships, and this is in part, I think just due to history, that it's been so, such a recent thing, such a recent convention, and for very few, a very small percentage of the population, that to have this amount of choice in who you associate with, not just who you marry, but even just who you're friends with, there's yeah. so much opportunities and choice in there. Whereas before, it was you were physically around maybe 150 people, then you could pick maybe like just the, the time constraints that you had, the limitations you had. Everyone is kind of based on similar kind of experiences so there's similar kind of reactions to it there's general things you can expect from meeting a new person but you still came down to picking from those 150 people who's going to be your actual spouse who's actually going to be your main friends that small group but then now there's a wide range of people there's a wide range of people out there so i think a lot of people approach relationships and think i'm going to be who i think this person wants me to be rather than just idea of oh you shouldn't work with friends you shouldn't like business and and, and family doesn't really mix it's because most people's friends and family suck like <laughs> the way they define those groups is, is very is very weak in part due to their lack of self-knowledge and self-confidence in being out there testing those waters so if they already feel this is how we this is the mistrust this is a lack of comfort i have with my family then of course, it's good to be worse with like they're just these random people. But I think there's there's that kind of dichotomy there. For me personally, doing this series, having these conversations with Stephen, like I can't really imagine like just getting a random person and just hiring them to just come on and have these conversations. With Part of the comfort because of the the relationships that we built, and I I most definitely see that the happier people are people who have that kind of confidence and have those kind of people in their lives, and the people who work on businesses with that way. Yes, you still have to have the relationship and say, okay, we put that aside when we're actually doing X, Y, Z. But I think getting to understand and value X, Y, Z in part is strengthened by having the valuation of an actual valuable friendship and relationship in the background. Whereas in most cases, I think focusing on X, Y, Z, actual objective goals, normally exposes how weak the actual relationship was built to begin with. Like that wasn't your friend if you really can't work on certain things together. That's at least my estimation from some of these things. 
and Silas and I talked about this for several years. I mean, I've known Silas. We've known each other, what, like six years, something like that, six, seven years now. And we talked about how, like, especially when, like, Trump was running the first time and all that, when things started becoming more polarized and people started becoming outspoken, all these people were saying, like, oh, I'm losing friends. It's like, are you losing friends? Are you just realizing who your real friends are? And now you're seeing the same thing, of course, with the pandemic and the vaccine and all that. And then it's like, you know, you you and I have talked about this too, Laura. Like, you reexamine what is the basis for my friendship? What were my relationships with certain people like? Were they really built on solid ground, or was it more because they're in my vicinity, or because I'm related to them, I'm supposed to respect them? But like, it's just that, like in of itself, it's nothing beyond that. Uh, yeah. Well, and it's all yeah. how you frame um, your perspective, right? Like, I I know that I said that to you a number of times, Stephen. Like, oh, I'm losing so many friends, but then I just had this light bulb moment, like walking down the street the other day, and I was like but I've gained so many more, so many yeah. more fulfilling, yeah. enriched relationships that are like so fascinating. And I'm constantly learning things from people and yeah. I'm being challenged and so open, like completely unfiltered. Whereas before some of those old friendships, you were playing a role. And I think a lot of people do that. And it's just yeah. like, it's so liberating to just let go yeah. of that and be like, okay. And, but with that comes some recalibrations of maybe some familial relationships, like maybe with your parents or your sibling or something like that. Yeah. Like there, it comes at a cost in some yeah. respects. Yeah, so. for sure. Right. Connection issues. I was saying you don't pick your relatives, but you build your family. Family is, is due to actions and experiences and shared goals and things like that. But relatives, if somebody gives birth to you, gives you up to adoption, <clears throat> that person is your relative. That's your mother and your biological father. That's a relation. But yeah. the, family is the person who raises you and the, the brothers and sisters and cousins and other people that you meet the person you meet and marry there's no actual blood relation but that becomes your family so i think there is yeah what's definitely a big difference in those two terms sure yeah Absolutely. um i, I also try to think of ro the world as like role-playing games <laughs> this is kind of like slots on some of these games you have like a limited friends list so like when you free up a few slots you can like add other people if you <laughs> like to like use that yeah. section. and it, also um we have different kind of affinities we're doing certain things and i think if you're doing something that you really like doing like you said you were working in a certain position and then you switched and you're still in the similar industry but yeah you're doing a different position in that industry and then now you're going to meet and fit with people in a more um in a more conducive kind of way so i don't know if we can transition to the first question which is like with those kind of things you can meet somebody and you're like okay i'm i'm good at what i do i like what i do so you'll meet people who you can see that we'll be able to support you to do things that you like doing. So with this, can you tell us like two to three things that someone would like about what you do that you think that you see in other people that, oh, I like those people doing it or people would look at what you do and say, okay, I like that. I would want to be part of that or I'd want to have, have someone like that around me. Okay. Um, I guess probably the first one that comes to mind is my writing. Um, I'm just sort of able to get across ideas that I'm really passionate about. Um, and that's kind of like how I built my voice, like, especially when I was living in BC. Um, and I had struggled for a long time figuring out like what I wanted to specialize in, because obviously I can't be a wine expert of everything. That's just not realistic. Um, and then it just sort of happened very effortlessly that I became sort of this like open organ wine expert and experts aren't even the appropriate term. Um, and then when I came to Toronto, it was sort of like, the floodgates opened and it was like, oh, I can kind of like be a voice for Canadian wine. Um, and so just through social media and various efforts. So I actually started a conference in 2019 called the Sensory Symposium. And I would just gather various winemakers and other sort of tastemakers and dissenting voices in the industry and just talk about kind of like ongoing issues. Um, so that would parlay into the second thing that I would say people know me for or what I'm good at is hosting events. Um, and that's why the pandemic has been really challenging. Um, I just love to bring people together because it's like that whole notion of like high tide rises all boats. It's like, oh, you should meet this person and then you connect them and then everybody benefits. It's like success is not a pie, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's been really fun doing that again. I just hosted my first wine pop-up in like almost two years in Vancouver and it was so much fun. It was just, and that that's another thing. It's like sort of um, challenging convention where I'm sure Steven, you've gone to a lot of like wine trade events where it's just so mm -hmm. stuffy and it's like, you can try this 0.5 ounce of this. And then they regurgitate the text sheet and it's so boring. Yeah. And I'm just like, everybody bring a bottle. I'll bring some cool shit. Let's just drink and have fun. And like, like take a load off. And like, that's where you get to know like the realness of people. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then I guess third, probably just like, 
wine marketing promotion, but I try not to do it in like a cheese ball, like influencer e way. Um, I don't like do ads or like paid shit. I just talk about the wines that I'm really passionate about. And it's because of how antiquated our liquor systems are here in Canada. And so I'm, I act as like that bridge to connect people to really cool wines that they would otherwise not have heard about. Um, just through Instagram and newsletters and articles and stuff like that. And yeah, so I feel very fortunate. I'm pretty lucky to get to do what I do. I have to say, I'm like, is this my, my life really? Like, am I really doing this? Like, it's pretty fun. So, yeah. Sure. I was going to ask, uh, why natural wines? What drew you to that specifically? Um, just working in so many different wineries. So like I've been a sales rep, I've worked in vineyards and cellars, um, managed like wineries, tasting rooms, a whole bit. And the bulk of them lie to, to the consumers. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not honest about what goes on behind the scenes. And I too, wasn't really aware of the additives and man- manipulations that are done everywhere from like the vineyard all the way through to the cellar. So like herbicides and fungicides and pesticides like really aggressive shit like wineries that are saying oh we're sustainable but we spray glyphosate on our vines but we're sustainable like it's it's so there's such a disconnect um and then carried through into um the winery itself the amount of additives that are used it's obscene like sugars dyes acids enzymes nutrients like fish derivatives egg whites like People don't know yep. that not all wine is vegan. Like yeah, the list goes gonna... on. Um, oak chips, like all kinds of weird shit. It's just like a simulation of wine. It's not even really wine. And then people have this very idyllic sort of romanticized version. They think there's some granny with a little basket picking grapes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. trotting down and, and then foot stomping it. And it's like people do make that wine that way, but not these big volume producing commercialized entities. Like, so yeah. it was just this big eye opening moment for me. And then I just sort of barreled deep down the rabbit hole into natural wine. But then I, I too myself became a zealot and I was very dogmatic and like, I don't drink conventional wine. I'm too cool. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and I'm like, the zealotry is just as bad on the opposite end of the spectrum. Charlatans exist in all realms and capacities. It doesn't really matter what it is. There's always going to be people who sort of like wield whatever happens to be trendy for their own personal gain. And so I've sort of come like, full, full kind of like center again, where with a lot of my beliefs, actually, because when you kind of like go too far either one way, it's like, you can kind of lose your way a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm happy with where I've landed because Canada in and of itself is not entirely like natural. There's a lot of challenges with growing grapes here. Um, so you kind of have to be very pragmatic about your approach and just be realistic and be like, okay, maybe I do need to use this spray because, like Niagara is so wet and they have so much disease pressure. It's like, it's really hard to be like a hundred percent natural. And if someone is saying that they are, they're probably lying to you. It's not unlike the wellness industry or yeah. any of that shit. Like there's a lot of greenwashing all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the, the thing about animal products I find interesting. Cause like my friend Abraham, he adheres to the kosher diet. So like only certain wines are kosher. So like when like, when he goes out, he picks wines off the kosher shelf. And he says, when I go to his house, I can have wines that are non-kosher. I have to drink them out of separate cups. Like their rituals actually require that. But like, but that gets into all the things with like the animal products that are used, how they're produced, have they been blessed? Like it's really, it's really interesting to like delving into a lot of that stuff. Uh. Well, I, I um, was friends with a winemaker who um, worked at one of the biggest wineries in Canada in BC and they made kosher wine. And literally all it was, was a separate bin cordoned off elsewhere in the cellar. And then a rabbi would come and bless it. And that's it. <laughs> that's what made it kosher. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I, was, I was wondering, the, the whole vegan aspect. What aspect, what sort of things would they be adding in that would be animal products? Like butter or something? Like what, what's added in? Hey. Well, egg whites are used for clarification. Yeah. Like, uh, if you make yeah. like consomme, it, it um it pulls out the impurities because egg whites have a high alkaline uh, content, so it like yeah. pulls out the impurities. But then it's not vegan because it's contacted with animal product. You know about it's a little unrelated, but you know about Guinness is filtered with fish bladder originally. So like, if you drink Guinness, mm-hmm. it's not yeah Guinness is not vegan. So they're talking about doing a vegan Guinness where I guess they filter it with something else. But then certain people say like that's not like the real thing. So you know, yeah. Yeah. Ice and glass or whatever. But, um, what I was going to say about like the whole kind of ethos behind natural wine, so long as it's balanced, of course, um, the wine just tastes better. It's very similar to buying tomatoes from the, um, farmer's market versus at Costco. There's a difference there. Yeah. Um, the flavor is more intense. It's just, 
it tastes more real. Um, that kind of sounds a little bit redundant to say. Um, and I think it's just better for future generations to come because you're not just perpetually like salting the earth with so much garbage and yeah. you're promoting a lot of like biodiversity and welcoming like beneficial insects and cover crop and animals and fruit trees. And it's like, it's that same sort of like notion that I was discussing before with respect to relationships. Um, everything kind of like thrives when it's permitted to sort of just you know, go on its own like natural course. Um, and so if you drink or taste any of like the most iconic wines from all over the world, they all subscribe to this philosophy, but they don't wave that flag. It's only become trendy in the last kind of like 30 to 40 years. Okay. And then, like I was saying, a lot of people have jumped on this bandwagon because it's cool and hip and there's tons of like natural wine, but oh, is it natural? But then <laughs> you get into that whole um, area of like flaws. So a lot of the wines if they're not made correctly or appropriately. Um, it's a very time intensive, laborious process. Like you need really, really clean fruit. So that requires like a healthy, like staunch devotion to your vines. Um, cause you can't turn bad fruit into good wine. It's like putting yeah. lipstick on a pig. Right. Yeah. So you can, you can taste that. And, um, I'm not going to go into like the whole host of like flaws of wines or anything like that. Cause it's not going to be that interesting to everybody, but, um, a big issue in the natural wine sphere has been a flaw called mouse. And it's a bacteria that proliferates when the process is sped up too much, also without the use of any sulfites. Um, and it tastes like a dirty mouse cage or like what I have described as like semen. Like it tastes like funky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a retronasal reaction. So you can't smell it. You can only taste it. And you're like, oh my God, what did I just drink? And now there's a lot of people who are hiding behind their convictions. They're like, well, my wine's natural. Mouse is just a consequence of doing it this way. And it's like, no, you just don't know what you're doing. And you're hiding behind those convictions. Why? you know, why does DRC not taste mousy? Like, how have they figured it out? You know? So, um, that's where I really struggle with a lot of these people. They're just, they're very dishonest and it really pisses me off. And so I try to always just preach the truth and be like, no, you're not telling the full story. So <laughs> we have a separate series called dishing on dish where we talk about primarily in food and uh, Stephen is knows way more about wine. For me, I, I don't drink anymore, but even when I did, I could tell when wine was bad, but I didn't know why it was bad. <laughs> I could just like, I could be like, okay, this is pretty decent wine. And then somebody who knows more about it would be like, yeah, that's good. But then if it's bad, there's, there's, there's a level that I think your average person can tell. But the industry definitely, it, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people who seem to be a lot more interested in wine. Now I see all of these companies like shipping wine all over the world and things like this, different areas. I think even in Kenya, they're starting to do a wine industry. I know some places in South Africa is now doing like internationally recognized wine and things like that. So it's an industry that's exploding. So I can imagine there's a lot of interest coming in, a lot of new clients, new customers. You'd mentioned that you had some frustration with the liquor systems. So could you tell us a bit about that? And also, is there ways for the people who actually do want this, do want to actually get the actual good natural wines and find find the people who are not doing these shady things? Are there any systems or sites or locations that you think are doing it that in a good way that people who are interested in getting wine would be able to go to and find that? Or do you do it yourself? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so with respect to the liquor laws in Canada, they're just extremely archaic. Um, a number of them um, date all the way back to like the early 1900s. Um, and they're just structured. They're, they're basically monopolies and they're just state-run entities they prohibit choice, innovation, competition. Um, and I didn't really realize how severe it was until I moved to Ontario because every province is different. BC is semi-private, so some government-run entities and then also private. Um, I also lived in Alberta for a large chunk of my life, and that was 100% private, and that was the best because obviously like, you could find whatever you were looking for. And then I moved to Ontario, and I was like, oh my God, like people have Stockholm Syndrome here. Like it's insane. And when people sort of start to try and incite reform um, by way of privatization, the belief systems that people have, they're like, this is an alt-right conspiracy theory. And I'm like, what? Like, are you guys okay? Like, we can't, we can't even access wine province to province. So there was this really old law, Bill C-91, that prohibited interprovincial shipping. That was um, abolished in 2019. So then everybody wow. thought like, oh, great. Now we can legally ship wine to each other. Um, no. So all that happened was the buck was passed federally to um, the provinces. And 
the specifically Ontario and Quebec came out in full force, threatened jail time, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fines if you try to ship wine direct to consumer in these provinces. And so wow. it's just so stupid. And not only that, um, they treat any import, whether it's from Italy or BC or any other province, the same. So every single bottle of wine that lands in Ontario is marked up 72%. And that's even before freight or taxes or anything or commission. So wine is really expensive here. Canadian wine is really expensive in Canada. Like it's so fucking stupid. Um, so that's why I started my wine club. I've just, I'm just sort of skirting around the rules and I exist in a gray area. And the irony of the whole thing is that all these wineries who cannot participate in these structures and systems because it's a pay to play system. You got to be like a big kind of like conglomerate to be able to afford to buy shelf space. They just ship direct to consumers anyway, and they use Canada post to do it. Which is also a government owned yeah. entity. It's like it's you, so dumb. It's so stupid. Like you, you had said to me too, like a lot of the wines that like I'll buy at Trader Joe's are a lot pricier there, right? Because of tariffs and things. So like there's certain wines that I'll get at Trader Joe's for like twelve, thirteen bucks, but you said they're even more in Canada just because of all yeah. this stuff. Yeah. So, uh. Yeah, it's it's so stupid. Um and then people will argue like, oh, Canadian wine is so expensive. And it's like, well, yeah, look uh. at what we're up against. And yeah. that's even outside of like the price of land, land is so yeah. expensive here. Like we don't have the benefit of like generations owned property that's just passed down. Right. We'll get there in a couple <laughs> hundred years, but yeah. we're in our infancy, like in terms of quality wine production from Canada, maybe 40 years. And even then that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. Cause I would say it's only really gotten to the point in terms of like a qualitative perspective where it could compete globally in like the last decade and that's like me being wow. really nice. So, yeah, it's it's, it's challenging because people don't take Canada seriously. They're starting to now, but they haven't for a long time for a whole host of different reasons. So it's uh, I remember I was talking to a colleague of mine at a trade event and he was like, keep like fighting the good fight. He's like, understand that it's going to be an uphill battle if you're going to like take on this whole Canadian wine thing. And I'm like, OK, I like a challenge. So. <laughs> yeah, because contrast contrast that with Europe, where it's like they've been producing wine since roman times or earlier and they i mean obviously they got stricter as time went on but it's like it, it from what you're saying this is like this is almost like that in its earlier stages like it like they're not it's going to be a long time before they like match europe in terms of yeah. um yeah exactly yeah so what, what are some good places that you think people can go to find good access to wine like i, I will we'll have the links below these you can share some links definitely all the links to your content to your, your stuff so it to be somewhere wherever you listen to this but where, where do you think is a good way to get past some of these the, the shysters and get past some of the government things like you said there's great areas and there's newer ways to actually get access to good quality wine out there in, in the world um, yeah, like make relationships with like your local bottle shops, I would say. And my business partner and I were talking about this. The merchant has to be the most honest person in the supply chain, because if say you purchase something and then you don't like it, you're not going to trust that opinion ever again. Right. Whereas like the winemaker could say like, oh, it was a bad vintage or we were short staffed or whatever. You know what I mean? So definitely bottle shops, but also making really building relationships with, with like your local importer. Um, and that's what I've done. I've just like skirted around like the LCBO entirely and just found the people who are importing the wines because they're the ones doing the vetting and they're the ones building the relationships and tasting stuff. And then also just like bringing it in based upon, you know, their assessment of quality. Um, in terms of like actual websites, sadly, with respect to Canadian wine, um, there's not a lot of voices that are otherwise like sponsored or like bought and paid for kind of like shills. Um, it's so fragmented, like regionally you can find stuff, but even then it's, it's very bureaucratic kind of structures where it's like wineries pay to be members of these associations mm. that yeah. market on their behalf. But it's like, it's not, they're not telling the full, the, the full picture. And then I also get really frustrated when I see like these wine awards and I've judged in these wine awards before. And it's like, you're tasting sometimes 200 wines in a day. And then even then, it's only a very small snapshot of, you know, say a handful of wineries that have submitted these samples to participate. It's just another marketing exercise. So it's like you're kind of like picking the best of the worst, you know. Yeah. So it's I don't know. It's a very time intensive, like laborious hobby. But that's why I'm trying to sort of like be that bridge. And like I just relaunched my website because I'm trying to sort of just have all this content live in one place where you can be like, OK, what are the wineries I can trust that are transparent and honest and 
what wine bars could I go to that are like pouring examples of this and then just bringing in contributors from like all these different regions and locations and having all of this stuff live in one place. It's very much a work in progress still and it's nowhere near where I want it to be, but that's where I want to want to go at some point because everything is just, uh, it's all just an agenda to like make money yeah. and it's, it's not, not, there's nothing real and it really bothers me. And it's like, maybe I'll get to a point where I need to start charging for this stuff too, but I talk to enough people on social media that, that I know that there's a demand for this. And like you said, Silas, there's the curiosity and just engagement and passion for learning about wine has exploded. And so there's so much opportunity to participate in this space right now, I think. So. Yeah, you, you definitely, I mean, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk after this and see if you can come on and help Stephen out a bit, not help Stephen out, but I think you and Stephen talking about the wines that go with the different meals and things that he eats would be a lot more engaging than me and him doing, because I have like no knowledge about the wines yeah. and things. That could be an accompaniment to that, to that uh, series, maybe. Yeah. Um, totally. Any other questions you have on the first one, Stephen? Uh, no, I think that's pretty good. Okay. So now we'll go to some sections that you've already talked about some of these things, some of the people that you have to deal with. And I think this is a common thing. And this is part of why we're doing this series is a lot of people look at something and people will market the positive aspects of it. But I think I, I, almost, <laughs> I was almost thinking if you're actually doing a job application for people, it might actually make a better, make, make better sense to ask people what they dislike rather than what they like because people can say mm. the things they like it doesn't really cost you too much it doesn't really put you too much thought into actually thinking oh this is something that i like everyone can find in general something that they like so this one name two to three things that someone may dislike about what you do that they might not think oh. is part of what you're doing what entering and what discussing what working with minds would, would would involve um well that's easy because people don't like that i'm outspoken that mm. i at my at the event that I hosted in Vancouver, I um, this woman who's a agent for a Spanish winery. She was like, "Yeah, your brand in the industry, you're known as controversial." <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess truth is controversial right now, um, and I'm I'm just not afraid to like. Here's a perfect example. Um, I saw a tweet by a relatively well known wine writer and critic, and he was complaining that a winery so dared tried to charge him for a tasting and the sentiment that he actually typed out publicly was like, do you even know who I am? Why don't you Google me? And I was just like, that's so arrogant and so presumptuous and entitled. And so I put it out to my followers. I was like, what do you guys think about this? Like, it's kind of like rubs me the wrong way a little bit. And I got so many responses. People were like, yeah, he's a dick. He's so arrogant. Like, I'm so glad that you called this out. And then he messaged me and was like, this is unfair. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't say it. And I'm like, well, here's your tweet. I can see it right here. <laughs> um, and so I think some people, I, for the bulk of my life, it's always, I felt like people always want to silence me because I know I'm brash. I know I'm, <laughs> and I know I'm abrasive and that can rub people the wrong way because I'm not like playing nice. Like I think- yeah. Not that I subscribe to this so much, but in some ways I do. Like women are sort of conditioned to be agreeable, right? Yeah. And I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about this all the time. It's like agreeableness doesn't get you ahead. Disagreeableness yeah. does. And men tend to um, embody that more so than women. And I found that it's it's been really successful for me because I don't get treated like good for my job as a woman, I find that so infantilizing when it's like women in wine, it's like, no, it's just people in wine, you know? Um, so, and I mean, it's taken me years to get here, but, um, when people ask me like, Oh, well, how do you, how did you like build your business? It's like, I just didn't ask permission. I just took a seat at the table, like let your work speak for itself. Don't make it about your gender or anything like that. So yeah, I, I don't even know if it's like multiple things. It's just the fact that I'm yeah, very outspoken and I, I act, I kind of like masquerade as though I don't care. Obviously I do care a little bit. Sometimes I'll be yeah. lying there at night being like, Oh God, how many people mm. did I offend this <laughs> time? But mo for the most part, it doesn't bother me because it, it resonates with people who are similar to me. And the more that you double down on that, the more you attract like-minded people. So 
Yeah. I think you hit some. You, you hit an important nail in the head there with about asking for permission because that company Praxis, Silas, that you and I have talked a lot about, that's one of the things they really espouse about not asking for permission because that's what school teaches you. Like, ask for permission to do this, to do this, to do that. And it's like, if you were run a business, it's like you have to make those decisions. You can't, there's nobody that you can go to and be like, hey, can I do this now? Oh, you have to make those decisions. But the school system teaches people to just fall in line and do what they're told. So I think part of that is the schooling system as well, among other things. Oh. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. People think that you, you can be con you can be concerned about something without letting it control you. Uh, people think, yeah. oh, because you're not following what I what I'm saying or what I'm telling you, doesn't mean I don't care about what you're saying. I just I've listened to you. I've taken that into account. I know there's challenges. I know there's risks and things like this. Yeah. But I'm still going to do this because I also know myself. I've also listened to myself. I also know have some faith and trust in my capabilities to do things. And sometimes you'll fail. Sometimes you have to regret some things that you do. But that's part of life. You learn and then yeah. you kind of build up on that. And I think yeah. that's something that is attractive to people in general. But, yeah. okay, how much did you like wine before you started thinking that, okay, you're going to get into this? Maybe this is I, this probably bleed into that question later on. But uh, this, that's one of the things like... Uh, we have a mutual friend who is a bartender, which is definitely not exactly the same, but they are slagging the, the product. But uh, she's actually, um, she was in, in, she decided to stop drinking. She's, she doesn't drink anymore, but she works in that. So in that sense, you're not necessarily giving people advice about the wine itself and the things like that. So you don't really have to take in the, you don't have to drink and taste all the beers to be like, oh, this is good. Or you can even memorize that stuff. So you don't necessarily have to take in the product, but I think you're closer to actually working with the people creating the product, getting more knowledge about it. So how much do you think someone should like wine? Like if they don't like wine that much, if they're more of a beer drinker, if they don't really drink that much, do you know anyone that actually doesn't drink that's in your general field? Oh yeah. There's lots of people. Cause I mean, alcoholism and just substance abuse is a big issue and that yeah. leads into a whole host of other things, sexual misconduct and harassment and all of that shit. Um, yeah, there's, there's very famous, like, um, the owner of Joe beef in Montreal. I mean, yeah. I'm sure Steven he's, he's sober. He's been sober for like a decade now. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other people, um, lots of people I work with who they'll taste, but then they'll spit, um, just because they can't, they can't function normally or like responsibly. And yeah, I definitely have to like check myself every now and again, where I'm like, okay, maybe I should probably put the brakes on a little <laughs> bit here. Um, yeah, it's it's that's that's the kind of dirty underbelly of the wine industry and beer industry and spirits. It's like people kind of look the other way when the debauchery kind of goes down. <laughs> it's like <gasps> what goes on behind closed doors should probably remain there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of like converting people or trying to get people to be open minded, that's essentially the goal of the tastings that I do because um, I actually host them through Airbnb experiences which I sort of have a little bit of disdain for because I hate being connected to such a major corporate entity, but the traffic they send my way is so phenomenal. And I actually really appreciate the community. Um, they really practice what they preach. And I get tons of people like tourists coming to Toronto and they'll be like, oh, can you only pour me this? Or you can only pour me that? Or can I bring my own drinks? And I always say, no, I'm like, no, I'm not here to pander to your little box. It's like, you're coming here to learn something new. And yeah. most of the time when people arrive, They'll be like, oh, I hate this variety or this style. And then they'll leave loving that thing that they said or they thought that they hated. <laughs> so it's really nice to kind of burst people's bubbles. And that's I, I did a tasting last night and that exact thing happened. And then I have another one tomorrow. And someone was like, oh, can I just bring my own drinks? And I'm like, no, why are you coming? <laughs> Like, <laughs> don't come. <laughs> I, I, I think I'd, I think I'd mentioned yeah. this in a previous video, Silas, but there was what Thomas Keller says about like his style of menu, how the idea is that it's kind of like going to a Broadway show. Like they take you through the experience. It's not like, it's not like, when you go to a Broadway show, you just go through their experience. Like you don't dictate how you want the story to go. And I think what you're getting at with wines, it's kind of a similar thing. Like you like you're taking them through the experience and they have to be open to, you know, they they may not love everything, but at least be open to the possibilities. Whereas if you just pick out a handful of things, it's like, well, you can go to the store and buy those yourself. Like what's yeah. the point? Uh, exactly. Uh. Yeah. So anything else you have to say about things that in in the field that maybe you got into it and you're like, okay, I wasn't really expecting this to be this way. And then you found out about it and you're like, God, I don't really like this. Um, I mean, similar to like kind of how my political beliefs have just sort of exploded and changed so much. And I've talked to Stephen about this ad nauseum where I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, the world doesn't operate the way that it's sort of 
people want you to believe that it is, right? It's, yeah. ex- it's the exact opposite. And uh, the wine industry is very similar. And I used to have a lot of adulation for mostly men. And I'd be like, wow. And I'd have them on this like pedestal. And uh, I remember I met one specific critic and I was talking to a friend of mine about it. He was like, yeah, never meet your heroes, man. <laughs> 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 like you just sort of see they're like, Oh, you're human at the end of the day. And it's, I think it comes back to that whole notion of like wearing masks and sort of playing a character, which isn't always necessarily an accurate portrayal of who that person is. Um, so yeah, I try to seek out people that aren't playing that game and waving that flag because it really is a performance at the end of the day. So, um, I'm not really surprised by it. It's like, it's just like anything else in life. Um, it's disappointing, but I'm glad that I'm aware of it now. Um, because I can't remember who said this. It was some like, I don't know, motivational speaker. Maybe it was Tony Robbins or Gary Vee or something. It was yeah. like a lot of people exist yeah. within like the mediocrity because yeah. that's what they think that they're supposed to do. But it's like, if you level up and go to like that next echelon, it's like, there's a hell of a lot less competition. And that's yeah. kind of what I've realized. It's like, stop playing that role of like, you know, dumb blonde, like wine influencer and just really tap into like my natural talents. And it's like, now the relationships I've built with people are incredibly intelligent, like far more intelligent than me that I learn from constantly. And it's like, yeah, it's just, it makes me sound smarter. And that was a kind of a a thing that my dad always encouraged me to do. He's like, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you (laughs) because you will benefit. (laughs) So, Uh I was just going to add, I'm glad you brought up Joe Beef, Silas. I don't know if you've heard of this, but they have a sandwich. It's a foie gras double down. It's actually foie gras coated with bacon and fried chicken skin, mayonnaise and maple syrup on a sandwich. Uh, but I remember, I remember at, my, at my old job, they're, they're like, oh, wow, you like foie gras. You ever try this? I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I can eat that. That's like, I'll, I'd have to like do like a very tiny portion or split it up. <laughs> Even for me, that's a lot. <laughs> and you say you don't have a problem with foie gras. No, but uh, just like a piece of foie gras with bacon and other stuff. I'm like, I don't know. That's a lot. <laughs> Sounds a bit much. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, foie gras. That's something that comes over repeatedly in the in the dishing on uh, dish series. <laughs> like, but it, I'm, I think that's good that you're pointing those things out of not just falling in for these things. And you're talking about mediocrity or people just entering certain roles and just behaving in a certain way. And I've got to the point where now if I see something being marketed based on like a happenstance of the company or the people involved in it, they're like, oh, this is black owned. Oh, this is a this is a Kenyan, this is a, the first the first shoes like created by a Kenyan women's company. I'm like, okay, someone just born in Kenya, there's born female. I actually almost actively now avoid companies that <laughs> yeah. try to sell on something that's yeah. a happenstance. You just happen to be born that way. That's yeah. as mediocre as you get. I want to know yes. about the actual product. Just tell me, is the product good? Don't sell me on this other thing that has that should have nothing to do with the actual product that you're actually yeah. producing. And that's that's something that it's a gimmick. Yeah, yeah. It's it's unfortunate, but people people seem to buy into it and to some extent. I don't know. Well, well I saw I, an ad sorry, for um something similar. Um a black female winemaker advertising that her wines are vegan. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, anybody can make vegan wine. You either just don't filter or you filter with bentonite clay. So that's irrelevant. And also nobody cares that you're black and female. Like it's Mm -hmm. just, you're trying to play that card because it's trendy right now, but it's like, what happens when, you know, we move on to the next rage cycle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what are people going to be enraged about? It's like, are they going to care that you're black and female? No, probably not. And like, I've spoken to a lot of people in the industry who are um, like, there's this one black guy in Niagara making wine. And he's like, people that never gave me the time of day came knocking on my door in the last year, just for like a photo op or whatever. And I'm like, and he even admits that like his wine isn't the best. It's like probably in that like mediocre kind of like slightly above average sort of range and it's like oh no they're just going because it makes them look good it's for their own personal gain and it's like yeah if you have to use any of those factors it's like then the product probably isn't that good like let the work speak for itself like i mean i don't know like think like drc drc doesn't need to advertise because everybody knows it's absolutely amazing and they clamor (laughs) to pay five thousand dollars for one bottle yeah you know what i mean so yeah i totally agree with you it irritates me so much well, I thought about that a lot with cars too. Like they say, that's why like Ferrari and Lamborghini and them don't advertise. Cause it's like, they're so well known. It's like, they don't have to spend time and money putting themselves out there. People already go there. 
<clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What was DRC? You mentioned DRC doesn't need to advertise. What's that? Oh, so it's a really famous winery in Burgundy. Um, it, it's an acronym for Domaine Romani Conti. And okay. they're like one of the most iconic wineries in the entire world. And they can command like thousands upon thousands of dollars for like one bottle. So it's just mm. like, they're the pinnacle of like what most people want to achieve in their, in their lifetime. Um, and obviously like the prices have like literally gotten totally out of control, but it's just like a matter of like supply and demand. Um, similar to like, I don't know, buying high end fashion or something like that. Um, I wish I could afford to drink that shit, but mm -hmm. maybe someday, maybe someday. Yeah. With, someday. With wines, mm -hmm. How, how close do they get the taste? Like if you get like, I know they have like the batches that they sell them in and they, they do it. Is, yeah. What is the classification? These are the things that probably might be better just in a separate wine thing. Maybe I do have some questions about wine. I do. Mm -hmm. I know uh, some aspects I have, you mentioned with the costs. I watched this one particular documentary and wine is kind of in the arts kind of field, the culinary arts, that kind of thing where there's a whole lot of corruption. And this one guy was just in the wine field, getting into the small years and just, he was, he, he made millions. He was just scamming people for millions and millions, just getting old crappy wines, repackaging them and then selling them out there. But you said when you get certain tastes of wine, let's say they're doing, they're grading their wine, they send them in. How do they keep the batches? Like how close is the taste and quality between one batch is it like they get a harvest of grapes and then all those grapes kind of taste the same how do they differentiate or how much does it change between the casks or <laughs> i don't know the language to even ask this question i don't know if that is made yeah any... that's no it's a really good question um so yeah the variation can be massive it can be from bottle to bottle it can be from barrel to barrel it can be from little literal like row to row like trunk to trunk like different pocket in the vineyard um, they can blend vineyards together or they can do all kinds of different processes of fermentation where maybe they destem the grapes or maybe they ferment it whole cluster. Um, they can ferment in like different vessels, anywhere from like stainless steel to concrete to plastic bins to clay amphora. Um, and then vintage variation plays a role too. If it was like a really cool and rainy, wet year, the acidity is going to be higher. Sugars will be lower because of UV penetration. Hotter year, higher alcohol, higher sugar process of fermentation right so um in terms of like quality wine absolutely you want that variation because it's essentially an expression of place like this came from this specific pocket and this is what the soil was comprised of maybe it's limestone or schist or sand or clay or a mix of like all of the above and like that's all going to apart different things mm -hmm. um when are they going to be picking? Are they picking for acid? Are they picking for flavor? Are they picking for balance? Like, what are they picking for? Because if you're making sparkling wine, you want higher acidity because it's going to go through two fermentations. But if you're doing like a big, bold, heavy red wine, you're going to want to let that fruit hang until late into the fall to really develop all of those flavors, but also balance and acidity and texture and all of that kind of stuff. So um, there's a lot of like um, homogenous products on the market for like the average consumer that doesn't care. It's like no different than going to McDonald's or like a franchise where you're like, okay, I know what I'm going to get. I want it to be the same every single year. And that's where the manipulations come in, where they can add sugar and adjust for flavor. So it tastes the same. Yeah. Um, but in the kind of <clears throat> realm that I'm existing within, I want it to taste like, oh, like I know, for example, like 2018 from BC, um, it was a really hot, but also smoky year. They had a lot of wildfires. So that actually permeates and comes through in some of the re resulting wines. And some people argue it's a flaw um, and they're having the same challenges this year. So it's like vintage variation. It tells the story of like what, what went on. And then you just sort of like, it's a process of deduction. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just so fascinating. Like the more you get into it, the more you're like, wow, you can choose your own adventure. Like, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Yeah. It's like, one winemaker described it to me as like a, a game of inches and it's just this cumulative sort of like journey where you're learning. You only have one kick at the can per year. You only have one harvest. And then you're like, okay, maybe I learned this thing yeah. because we got damage from hail. And then next year it's a completely different story. And you try to apply those things you learned last year, but they no longer apply. So yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. That's why I'm so, I get so like excited when I talk about wine. I'm like, it's so cool, but so, so hard at the same time. So, yeah. Well, I thought yeah. you, you kind of, you kind of see a similar thing with like um, certain vegetables. Like for example, I remember like the Japanese will actually grow Harry Cover, the French green beans. So they're all the same length. So that way they cook evenly. But a lot of places you buy them, they're uneven sizes. So you have to actually like alter your cooking accordingly. Like even cutting up carrots, like, 
thicker, thinner. You have to cut the change your knife cut in accordance. So they're, they're the same size. So they all cook evenly, but it's like, but that's nature. Things don't always come out the same size. Oh, in fact, yeah. they usually don't. Well, it's yeah. Attention to detail. Yeah. Cause yeah. the devil's in the details, right? Yep. Yeah. I know you focus most. You said you focus mostly on Canadian wines. But I have a two-part question. Like, with you talking about the, the the greenwashing that goes on and things like that, I know there is concerns with like climate impact, which is definitely a reality. I think most people are they put set the straw man up, like, oh, you don't believe the climate changes. No, the climate changes. I think the key is like climate impact. What's going to happen after that? And you have the different places, like with heat, like you said, in Canada, there's not that much land. Like, it's a massive country, but the amount of actual arable, I think arable is the term, where humans can actually yeah. live or yeah. walk off the land is like a tiny strip right by the border. Like, majority yeah. of it is permafrost. So you have yeah. kind of two things happening in the world right now, right by the equator, where the global south, as people say, people are starting to learn and use different things. And then with the climate impact, um, some places up north, like when they talk about the, the climate raising, it's actually mostly like it'd be like maybe three degrees over the last 200 years up in up north where it's a lot colder. But by the equator, it's gone up maybe point point five. So you have some places where it's like melting. So land is actually spreading and things like that. So that's going to open up more land for more different combinations of soil and climates and things like that to grow different grapes. Because um, can you tell us a bit about the grapes that grow in different areas and some knowledge about that. And also what you're seeing in emerging markets, if there's any emerging markets that you said, okay, there's some new wine coming from this new country, this new location that seems to be making a splash in the wine community or something. And also the effect of, of this, the, the climate changing in places that are more, that have a longer history of having wines in a certain set kind of way that maybe the temperatures are being changed or land is expanding or just, I don't know if that's too jumbled of a question. Mm. No, 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 it makes uh, makes perfect sense. And yeah, everybody's talking about climate change right now, but I agree with you. I think it's like, we're definitely in a warming trend, but I mean, we've seen this throughout history that it's cyclical. Like mm. um, there was another point in time where, you know, grapes were found in like Ireland and like Scandinavia. Yeah. Um, it was the medieval warming period. So it's like, it, it's just cyclical and it changes over time. And it's like, I'm not denying that climate change exists, but it's like, to what effect have humans like had on it. Right. And so, yeah. yeah, essentially what's happening right now is it is warming. And so people are moving towards different kind of like aspects. So like where normally maybe would people plant on like a South facing slope, they're planting um, on a different aspect and higher altitude also plays a role as well. Um, and that's also why you find vineyards generally are planted on slopes because you want the drainage and then you want like the impact of the sun and everything. Um, but in terms of Canada, um, you're, we're seeing a lot, um, of emerging varieties that are crosses of different, um, styles. So hybrids essentially. So traditionally, um, the noble varieties that are very well known and commonplace, um, that have really taken a hold of the market. Those are all Vitis vinifera. So that's just like one gene of grapes. Mm -hmm. And then hybrids are different <coughs> crosses of those, of different genes. So mm -hmm. like Labrusca and all kinds of like different yeah. names. And so the argument there is that they don't kind of like have as much complexity or structure or texture as say vinifera does. And so a lot of people are blending those two together. And that's what I encountered when I was in um, BC a couple of weeks ago when I was on Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. They're blending the two to sort of um, achieve the balance and uh, complexity that you can find elsewhere, but there's still a lot of naysayers and people who are very suspect about the use of hybrids because they just haven't like reached that level or like that pinnacle of quality because it's still kind of like a process of trial and error. Um, and yeah, you're totally right. Like where like all of the wineries, they, it's, it's actually mm -hmm. on the same, um, latitude as like champagne. And like, that's why you don't see anything above the 49th parallel in Canada because otherwise they just, they will not survive. Um, and of course there's little exceptions here and there and tiny little <clears throat> pockets. Um, but even then it's, they're, they're not that common, but there's wineries popping up all over now. Like Quebec is making wine now, Nova Scotia is making wine and predominantly they're making hybrids, aromatic whites and sparkling wine. And so when people come and do tastings with me and they want to taste like those big heavy reds, it's like, unless you get it from like a really specific pocket, um, I'm going to pour you what thrives in Canada. Um, and that's stylistically, I think what Canada is going to emerge for 
Um, like I said, aromatic whites, sparkling, um, and then light reds. So like Gamay, um, is very commonplace. And so that's, what's really interesting about like, kind of like the spread across Canada. There's all these little sort of micro climates, um, like on Vancouver Island, it's very maritime influence. Um, you actually do get influence from the ocean. So like aerosol sprays will settle on the skins of the grape and that will translate into like a very like saline forward presenting style of wine. Mm. Um, but that can also come from the soil and that, I'm not, that's not to say that the vines are actually absorbing mm. anything from the soil. It's all about like the, um, the hummus and like the impact and how the, the vines actually behave and thrive in different soil types. Um, limestone, um, is very prevalent in Niagara, Prince Edward County, little pockets in the Okanagan. And that tends to produce very like linear, very electric styles of wine, like Chardonnay loves limestone. Um, and that's why place and terroir, you probably hear this a lot. Like when you hear people talking about wine, it's so, so important because you need to find a very specific site for specific varieties. And that will change from like whatever kilometer to kilometer, like it, it's, it's so, so fascinating. And then like, even like one row of grapes will thrive so much better because maybe there's like more nitrogen in that one specific little pocket of like the vineyard. Um, but in terms of varieties, like, um, across Canada, um, generally as like a, an, an umbrella sort of like term, it's a cool climate growing region. So like I said, Gamay is emerging as a variety that does really well, both in BC, Ontario and Nova Scotia. Cabernet Franc. So those are like that light red sort of vibe. Um, and then in terms of white varieties, Chardonnay, um, Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris is mm -hmm. something that's coming out as being uh, a variety to be reckoned with. And it's really interesting when I talk to my like wine industry friends, they're like Pinot Gris, really? Because like they think of like that sort of boring table wine, yeah. Pinot Grigio, Santa Margarita. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, <clears throat> wine can be anything that you want it to be, right? Like uh, along the lines of what I was saying before about it's just all this, it's just like this all these little decisions along the way that you can make and vessels that you can age it in and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and then, sorry, I also forgot to mention Pinot Noir, obviously. Yeah. Um, Niagara, definitely. Um, and also Vancouver Island. A lot of people like to say that the Okanagan, um, does really well for Pinot Noir, but I have to disagree because it's too desert. Like it's, it, it's, it mm. does better with like the bigger reds, like South Okanagan Syrah. A lot of people are talking about now, um, but yeah, I would say those are kind of like the five or six varieties that like you should look out for. Um, cause there's a lot of people making phenomenal stuff and Riesling as well. And yeah, yep. I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule, but, um, yeah, it's, it, it's just really exciting. Um, and I, I love to sort of expose and introduce people to all of this stuff, um, especially producers that they've never heard of. Yeah. Um, that they wouldn't have otherwise. And they're always really excited. Like, wow, I didn't know that this even could you know, be produced in Canada. So yeah, it's, it's just an exciting time. Did, did I answer your question? That was like a very like yeah, multifaceted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, one last one. I was, if, sorry, go I ahead. Was one last addition. Is, is there any, like, what are some of the new, like, I, do you have any familiarity with anything coming from outside of Canada? That's like a new region that you think, okay, that's somewhere oh, to watch. Right. There's some great stuff coming out from that place. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always emerging regions. I think Australia was kind of written off as sort of just boring, over extracted, over oaked, kind of like big, heavy Shiraz, like people just sort of generalize. But yeah. um, there's a lot of really cool stuff coming out of there. And they're kind of a front runner for a lot of natural wine. Um, and then like, again, it always comes down to like little specific pockets, like Clare Valley and Eden Valley, they're making some really ex excellent examples of Riesling and like high altitude stuff. Um, Austria, um, they've been making wine for a while, but in terms of yeah. like the natural community, like, um, Bergenland <clears throat> and other areas surrounding there, oh, yeah. there's a whole host of different producers that are making really, really cool stuff. Um, where else? Um, oh, uh, there's, there was a producer that I've been really excited about from, um, Slovakia. Oh. Um, but I mean, these are all places that have been making wine for a long time, but we're only just starting to like get access to them as well. And then um, Slovenia is another one. Not that it's a new region at all, but like I had the chance to go there a couple of years ago and I was blown away at the quality yeah. of wine that I tasted there. And again, they've been making wine for like thousands of years. So like they've yeah. got it like dialed in, you know? Um, yeah, it's it runs the gamut like hungry and like, I don't know. I mean, even when I was in India, I went to a winery and mm. I mean, the wine wasn't that good, but I mean, yeah. I love that like they're 
trying and they're yeah. making an effort. Um, and I don't know if India will ever make like globally recognized wine, but I mean, for the locals, like why would, why would they not enjoy what's, what's on offer? Right. So it, it happens because even just my time back in Kenya, I've been splitting time between Kenya and uh, the States for the last like 10 years. And I was gone for like 17 before that, but just seeing the changes that have happened when I first got back, when I was of age of drinking, because when I first left, I wasn't. So it was mostly just international stuff. And then now, just in the 10 years, there's so many local companies doing their own things and things like that. I don't know if there's any specific um, Kenyan winery, but I know there's South African wine that comes up. I think some Nigerian yeah. places. But these are the things that they, yeah, they do start somewhere. And it's, it's interesting to see uh, these places just coming up and, and seeing what they can do with them. One last additional question before we kick it to Stephen. I know he had something to ask. Oh, you mentioned the grapes and things like that. Like, what are the what's the typical uh, strain of grapes that you normally find? Like when you go to like a super supermarket, and you find like or the grocery store and find like green grapes and red grapes. Like, which are those strains, and are there any wines that are actually good that are made from those basic strains, or do wine grapes are normally like rather different than the ones that are just sold as fruits? Um, so yeah, the ones that you'll find in the grocery store are typically Concord. Um, generally no, like they just don't have the structure and texture to sort of like create what we have come to learn as like, you know, traditional wine. Um, but I do know of one winery in Prince Edward County that did make a sparkling wine. They just made like a little, um, pet nut and it was called supersonic and it was actually from Concord grapes. And I think it only fermented to something like seven or 8% alcohol. And it was a very just sort of like peasant kind of drinking wine, something that, you know, you think of like you drink in the vines, like while you're taking yeah. a break in the sunshine or something like that. And I'm sure there's other examples, but generally, no, I don't encounter wines that are made from anything other than like, like I said, like Labrusca, Vinifera, hybrids, all of that kind of stuff. So maybe, who knows? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I, I, had a, I had a few things I was going to say. So it's interesting you bring up um, Austria, actually, because we're actually well, our, our most recent food videos are reviewing an Austrian place that I used to work at. And I think Austria has been greatly underappreciated. If you if um, I always bring up, if you ever saw the movie Gladiator, when they talk about Vindo Bono, that's actually referring to Vienna because um, in Latin, that means good wine. And that's actually what they called Vienna because it was known for um, the wines. And um, I think they said out of all the city capitals in the world, Vienna actually has the most uh, acreage within the city limits as far as grape growing, which is really impressive because you figure like, you know, we can talk about New York. But it's mostly a city, but then there's a the metropolitan area. But it's like there are not a lot of places to grow grapes whereas i think i haven't been to vienna but from what i've heard like because it's a smaller city it's like you go out a few minutes like you're already in countryside but that's all city limits so like the grapes can grow within that area which is pretty cool and um you mentioned borgenland which is interesting um my old boss uh wolfgang who came up in that video um he's from there and his family's actually heavily involved in wines that's the part that ordered borders uh hungary i think and um, then the other thing I was going to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on ice wine? I know, um, I think it was more from Germany originally, but it's been big in Canada, at least in recent years. Uh, my uncle is from Quebec. He's a big fan of it. Um, are you into that at all? Or like, what would you say about ice wine more generally? Uh. I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with it because it's put Canada on the map, but kind of to our detriment because people think either we don't make wine or we only make ice wine. Mm -hmm. um, and it is such a painful, painful process. You have to let the grapes hang um, very, very late into the season. And if it's a particularly warm season, sometimes like I know in the past, um, they haven't picked grapes until like February, like as late as February. Um, wow. and it's because you have to wait until a very specific temperature. It has to be a minimum, um, negative eight degrees Celsius. Um, and generally you're picking in the middle of the night. Yeah. So imagine being out in like minus 10 degrees Celsius picking grapes. Like there's a lot Ooh. of whiskey involved in this process. And like when I was growing up in Kelowna, <laughs> Like vineyard mm. managers would literally drive around and I'd be like waiting for the bus to go to school or come home. And they'd be like, hey, kids, you want to come pick some grapes? 20 bucks an mm. hour. And we'd be like, mm. no, not interested. Mm. Um, but I mean, there are certain markets that love ice wine, like China would be like the biggest one for mm. sure, because it's almost like a status symbol at this point. Um, mm. And for whatever reason, they just like like that really sweet style. Like when I've worked at some wineries in the past, they would come and just ask for like a full glass of it, which is like so disgusting and cloying to me. Um, but in certain respects, it can be very enjoyable, like with really salty, stinky, like blue cheese or with like specific desserts. So like in terms yeah. of food pairing, like you want to match like sweet with sweeter 
or just play that like sweet and savory sort of vibe. But honestly, like it's not a style that I reach for often. Um, mm. If I'm going to have dessert wine, it's probably going to be like Sauterne or Tokai or something. I'm okay. not going to be like, I'm, I'm in the mood for a Canadian ice wine. Like it's just not something that, <laughs> that I reach for. And I don't know if that makes me sound like a snob. I just, yeah, it's, I don't know. There's a specific market for it. And I just, I'm not one who's a big proponent of it. So my, yeah. my understanding too, is that there's very little yield. That's the other part. Like you have to pick a ton yeah. of grapes and you make like very little, like, I, I think my uncle would get these bottles that were maybe like this tall and like yeah. this thin, but they're like, you pay like 90 bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the time uh, that goes into it is insane. Yeah. And like you said, like you're literally picking the grapes when they're frozen. So it's like, think yeah. about the juice that you're extracting from each bunch. It's not going to be much, right? No. Um, and not to mention, it's just so sweet. But I mean, you're always looking for balance as well. So you want like that acidity to be there too. But it's like, it's not something that I would sit on my couch at night and sip, right? I'm going to reach for anything else other than ice wine. So... My, my understanding, too, is they have to be picked on the vine because they retain the acid that way, right? Because I heard some like yeah. some people in California just threw some into a freezer and pressed them, but they said that's not the same because it just tastes like no. sugar. Whereas with this, exactly. if they freeze on the vine, they retain the acid, yeah. Uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, any more questions? Any more things about what you think people might dislike about what you do? Uh... I mean, I'm sure they, some people probably don't like that I promote hybrids and that okay. I promote Canadian wine. And like, even every now and again, I'll, I'll have interactions with people that are super snotty about it. Even other Canadian sommeliers who are like, Oh, this is piss or like, Oh, this is, there's, there's, there's this thing with this within the sommelier community about typicity. So you say, say you have like a variety like Pinot Noir and like you come to learn through your studies that it's a thin skin variety and it, bears a light bodied but sometimes intense style of wine with like a lot of earthy notes or forest floor sour cherry that's what you're taught is like typical but obviously that's going to vary if it comes from santa barbara or the willamette or the okanagan valley or burgundy like it's going to be different no matter where it comes from and so when I was hosting my event recently, I had a Viognier from a little winery in Summerland called Lightning Rock. Mm -hmm. And I poured it for a couple of these guys and they're like, oh, this isn't typical. It's not like Condria, which is like what the, one of the most famous regions in France in the Rhone Valley yeah. that is. And that style produces this very like rich, unctuous, floral, very heady style of, of wine. But I'm like, well, it's not from the Rhone Valley. It's from Summerland. So why would you want it to taste like that? And mm -hmm. I kind of got into a little bit of an altercation with them. I got a little defensive because I'm so tired of justifying and defending Canadian wine. And I'm like, I'm not saying that it's like mm -hmm. premier cru or grand cru level, but unless there's ambassadors and champions of Canadian wine, we're never going to get there. Like that's, it's about the journey, but also like the destination. Like, yeah, we want to get there at some point, but we need to champion in these people. And we, we have to get out of this sort of like um <laughs> perpetuation of emulation and that's what emerging regions do they emulate oh champagne style bubble burgundy style pinot noir rhone valley style viognier it's like well no we need to form our own identity and like we have to stop like drawing these comparisons so yeah i have these kinds of conversations a lot especially with like it's always men for some reason. I don't know why they're so, they're so egotistical and arrogant about their beliefs. Like I know everything. And I'm just like, <laughs> no, I come barreling in to like burst their bubble. And, um, yeah, sometimes it can be a little touchy, but other times it's, it's successful for the most part. Um, but I mean, I also agree to some respect because a lot of these people that I'm talking to, like well-known wine writers and stuff, especially like in the UK, the access that they have to the wines that they have, like, yeah, I want to be drinking that really cool stuff too, but this is where I'm at and this is what I want to be supporting. And so it can be challenging sometimes because um, you want like the wines to be here, but we're only like quite here. And so I'm like, that's, I'm shepherding like the Canadian wine industry into like a realm where we, we can compete with these wines. So, but it won't be in my lifetime. It'll be future generations. All right. Yeah, but that happens. You grow, you grow the plant and then somebody else reaps the plant and somebody else <laughs> makes the wine and people enjoy it hundreds of years. Speaking about the, the time wise, not in your lifetime, what's the oldest wine you've had? I know that I saw some news story of some stuff that was found in like the ocean. And it was like, it was, yeah. pretty much just, it was pretty much just like plasma. It was just like, <laughs> coalesced into something. Yeah. It's like um, essentially vinegar, but yeah, what's the oldest you've had? 
I think I, I can't even remember. I think it's like we had like a birth year wine of like my boyfriend's. Um, it was like 1994. Um, I think it was a Riesling. I, I, I've never had my own birth year, which is 83. So that'll be the goal someday, but I just, I can't afford to drink that, that stuff. That, and that's the problem. Like there have been some sort of commentary and stuff written about like, um, Eric Asimov. He's the writer for the New York times. Um, yeah. He's their wine columnist. And he wrote a, he wrote an article about a year ago about how he used to be able to afford a lot of these wines that I am mentioning. And just by sheer supply and demand and like sort of the popularization of a lot of these iconic wineries, it's, it's not accessible. And he was sort of positioning it as like, um, an argument of inequality. Um, but I, I think it's just, yeah, scarcity really. Yeah. I mean, should everything be ac- accessible? I don't think so. I think that that's a fallacy, you know? And so I thought it was like a weird, like sort of passive aggressive flex, like, I used to drink uh, DRC. <laughs> like, cool, bro. Cool story, bro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Guess that writer salary not yeah, no, I mean, so far anymore. <laughs> with with the time wise things, one one last question on that. What is the whole? This is something again, just completely amateur. Don't know anything about wines. What is the transition between like wine and vinegar? What's what happens in that process? Like, are there any people who are like really good at making wine that also do really good vinegars, or is it an entirely different process? Like, what's that whole part in it kind of relate to that, I guess. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of different reasons for that. So oxidation is number one, um, but it all depends on like how the wine has been handled. And so there's like this weird phenomenon um, whereby if you expose the wine right from um, the get-go, from when you're pressing and fermenting it, the more oxygen it's exposed to, the more robust um, it's going to be. So even if the bottle has been opened for weeks or even months sometimes it'll just continue to change and morph and like be kind of like alive um but if it's been kind of coddled and produced in a very reductive capacity where it's like in a very inert kind of environment the minute it it is exposed to oxygen it's going to degrade very very quickly and that's most of the wines that um, we have access to on the market right now Um, and then another is just the proliferation of acetic acid Um, and there's another flaw called volatile acidity. Um, and some people say it starts in the vineyard and some people say it's a hygiene issue. Um, and that is just like too high of a percentage of acetic acid that starts to develop. And then it can present as like nail varnish, or I think that it kind of smells like Elmer's glue, Mm -hmm. but in small percentages, it can also almost be inviting. Um, it's kind of like that wabi-sabi thing, like that Japanese thing where it's like you embrace the imperfections. Um, as far as vinegar, like I don't, I don't, personally know many people that are making it, but I did come across some really beautiful styles when I was in Slovenia, um, which were delicious. And like, you definitely kind of like get those elements and like those traits of like whatever specific variety that it came from. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, nobody's ever asked me that question before, but yeah, obviously you're, you're trying to prevent that from happening. Um, but within the natural wine sphere of the people who are doing it well and are really kind of like making wine intuitively, Generally, that doesn't really happen because every step along the way that they're taking will prohibit that from happening. Unless, you know, the wine's been open for like a year or something like that, then yeah, I'm sure at some point it would turn to vinegar. But yeah, I don't really encounter that all that often. So, even anything else? <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to add on. Yeah, because I had a wine that was slightly oxidized and it had almost like dried fruit characteristics. So it worked like well if you were going to pair it with something else. But like I remember my friend was telling me, It's also, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. Like you could pair that with something else, but I think it also reaches a point where it's like, it's not really servable. I think as you're kind of saying, it's just, maybe there's like a fine, there's that fine line where if it oxidizes a little bit and has that characteristics, you pair it, you pair it with something else. But then if it gets like, goes really far, it's not going to be good anymore. Uh, Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay, so moving on to the next question. This one is a question that will work better again after we worked this out a bit more. Um, it's, are you, are there any occupations or pastimes that you think are kind of the opposite of what you do and both in your field, like in the actual field, do you think there's people who are doing something in a way that's kind of opposite to the niche or the area that you've worked out in the field? And also just in general, like part of the reasoning behind this is if you think there's like somebody who's maybe like teaching whale fishing <laughs> that's thing. Mm. somewhere, that's a complete opposite. So if you mention something that you think is opposite, we might find a way to, if we find somebody who's doing that thing, we get them to talk about this. Or if you are thinking of someone who's doing something 
that's completely different from you to but want to do something brand new in their life, they would be attracted to what you do. So what do you think is on that other spectrum? Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh damn. I wish I would have reviewed these questions earlier. Yeah. Now I'm like, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think just my interest in writing and like trying my hand at it and not really ever being trained in it or anything and just tapping into an ability that I think maybe came naturally to me. I'm definitely very curious to talk to other writers, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or anything. Cause I think, I don't know, maybe I should ask you guys this too. Like, do you think it's a skill set that can be honed or do you think it's like a natural talent, like singing or like playing a, an instrument or even like winemaking or something like that? Like what, what, what would you say? I would say personally, I think it's a bit of both. Cause they talk about like, um, certain comedians being like high on verbal intelligence and that's measurable. So you're good at like reading people and like knowing how to make people laugh. But at the same time, I think that can be developed further. And of course the most talented comedians really develop themselves to the limit. Whereas if the average person were to develop themselves, like they could get better at it, but they would never be like one of the top people. I think with writing, it's kind of a similar thing about like how well can you communicate? How, deep of a thinker you are if, like well if, i guess if you're writing fiction like how well can you come up with plot twists and like keep it exciting and not have too much filler i think some of that's a little innate but i think some of it gets developed too that'd be my guess anyway oh. yeah i think it's a mixture as you said it's a mixture of capacity and then aptitude whereas yeah. as you'd also mentioned in the start when you're speaking about languages there's different kind of things you're learning about yourself so if you're learning a new medium I think there's a level of comfort or self-knowledge of what to do in the thing, who you're trying to communicate with, because <laughs> at least with drawing and also writing myself, I do that. I do a lot of that. Just sometimes you have the ability to, something's in your mind, you put it down on paper and then somebody comes around, well, that's amazing. I'm like, in my mind, it's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> after some time, I think it's taken some time for me where I, I'm more comfortable with actually drawing, with expressing myself. I read my blog from like 10 years ago and I try to, read some of those posts out as a video. I'm like, oh, why did I think this was ever a good way to <laughs> So I think there, there is an aspect of that where it's, you kind of have that growth. So I think that, that definitely is, is, part, is part of it, yeah. And yeah. as you're getting at it, I think it's trial and error too, because I, I saw that with cooking where you try to make something the first time, you completely mess it up, and then you try it again, and it's like you're a little better. Then you do it a few times, and you get good, and then it's just instinctive. So I think, yeah. I think that's part of it too. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I feel the same way, but when I read my old stuff, I'm like, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> why did I put that out there? <laughs> but but, yeah, but, but I was, I was saying to you too, though, how I feel I'm not very creative, but one of the things that they've said is that part of creativity is you have to be willing to fail like that, or at least put yeah. stuff out there that like, you know, at the time you're like, you're, you may be proud, but then you look back and you're like, Oh, but then it's like, but the, the fact that you think that way, it shows how much further your stuff has progressed. So I think that's another part of it too. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Is, is there anything else you have to you have to say about like other jobs? Because there's there's things in your field where you feel like somebody is doing something a certain way in your actual field that you think, okay, that's kind of uh, the opposite. And I don't know. Um, would it be the people who are actually working? Like, this is something we had talked about with Stephen when you we were talking about the food the food service industry. How there's people who are in the back creating the actual content itself the food itself and then the front of the house people who are doing more of the marketing and interacting with the actual yeah. people like you yeah you said you haven't you don't have an actual farm but it seems that you have a lot of relationship between both those aspects Is, are there people who are just completely just they don't want anything to do at all <laughs> when talking to people they just want to make the wine or there's some people who are just don't want to deal with the people they just want to sell the wine are there people on that far of the spectrums within your oh, actual yeah. field most yeah. most winemakers are very, very antisocial. They work in a cellar for a reason. So they don't have to interact with anybody else. And that's why I kind of like act as, as that bridge. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty like niche where I have those behind the scenes relationships with winemakers. Whereas I think a lot of people, it's a little bit more superficial where maybe they have a relationship with like the agent or like the GM of a winery or something like that. You kind of have to have quite a vested interest to want to go and like talk to winemakers and learn their process and try to just from like a very, very um, superficial capacity, understand the science and the chemistry. Like I'll, I'll text like a friend of mine, Brent, he's a winemaker on Vancouver Island. I talked about him all the time because he's just this wine science savant. Like he can explain like, you know, 
how he extracts tannin and the polymerization of it and how it he feathers in like all the and it, he describes it as these like this like tube and then he's like it, it's just it's mind-boggling the way he can discuss wine and I'll text him and I'll try to like do it some service and he'll be like no you're completely wrong like I'll call you another day and I can like <laughs> and I'm like writing down everything that he's telling me because I just, I learned so much from him versus maybe just like picking up a book and just regurgitating or parroting like some other, like whatever wine science idea. Um, and that's, what's been really fascinating. The more that I talk to and meet winemakers, it's like, nobody has the same approach. So Mm -hmm. it's like annoying, but it's also fascinating at the same time. It's like, everybody's just doing it their own way. Like the rules are that there are no rules. And like, I think that that's so cool. So yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's definitely cool. Different people do things. I mean, different things happen for the same reasons, and the same things happen for different reasons. So it's it's really a fascinating yeah. thing that I've experienced from just going on. That's why I really enjoy these conversations. <laughs> but um, hmm, yeah. So in hopes or wishes or dreams to eventually make your own wine. Like I know th- there's something that also exploded not just here in Kenya, but just in the United States also. When this also happened, when I went to Europe and then I came back to the United States of America, when I left, it was just like basic big breweries. And then and now the microbrewery thing just exploded. Now there's all sorts of small beers in, in, in all over the place. Do you think there's a possibility of that happening with wines where you have like micro wineries or has that happened already? It's, oh, yeah. It's an entire different thing. Yeah, it's already happening. I have lots of friends who are working with wineries where they can buy like one ton of fruit. Um, and they essentially contract the winery to make them a label. Um, and they dictate style and obviously design the label and, um, obviously purchase the fruit and they fund the whole thing. And those would be like, um, what I would call like micro negotiations, but there's a lot of people like that's, it, it, it all is sort of generated in France where maybe you couldn't afford or didn't own land. So you would just buy fruit or already made wine. Um, and then maybe you would like age it in your own barrels make your own blends and then bottle it under your own domain. Um, and there's a really great book called adventures on the wine trail by Kermit Lynch. Um, and he talks a lot about this, like going back all the way to like the eighties and he was kind of like one of the OGs of like natural wine. Um, and that's sort of like where this kind of whatever virtual winery sort of idea came from, but tons of people are doing it now, especially in Canada, because it's just so expensive to make wine. Um, like I certainly can afford to buy land here. Um, but eventually I, I would like to make my own wine, but it, it probably won't be in Canada. Like I'd love to just like check out and go live in some like old dilapidated, like castle in Bulgaria and like plant <laughs> a bunch of weird indigenous, like mm-hmm. autochthonous varieties and be like a weird, crazy, like natural wine lady and have like a guest house and plant a whole bunch of like fruit trees and have a garden and like seven dogs. And yeah, that's, that's my goal in like the next five to eight years. So watch it, this space. It, it, <laughs> yeah, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll say, I, I'll say I knew her when. <laughs> yeah. We'll come back and we can have, I know great people. With and you guys are both invited and then we can film something in, in person in Bulgaria. Yeah. 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 We can add to the next part of the series or another part of the series. <laughs> but what's, what's the top range for the micro wineries? Like I, even with beers, I don't know, like what's the, for it to be considered micro, is it because of the size or the number of bottles they produce? What normally defines that? Yeah, the size. So like a ton of fruit generally will produce about a barrel of wine, which is roughly um, like a pallet, about 50 cases or so, probably a little bit less of wine. So it's really not much. Whereas like the average winery, like who I'm working with in Canada, I would say anywhere from like a thousand cases per annum upwards of like 10,000, but anything beyond that, I generally don't like love to work with them because then it's getting too commercial. Um, but 10,000 is like small to medium in terms of like the grand scheme of things when you look at it. And then there's lots of wineries that make a hundred thousand cases or 50,000 cases, or even the big, big commercial guys, they're doing like millions, obviously like, um, like yellowtail and, uh, fresh oh, yeah. net and stuff like that so yeah yeah but those all serve a purpose too like yeah. those are another bridge and like those styles are never going to go anywhere and i don't think that i want them to it's like we need kind of like every perspective right to sort of yeah. be able to step yeah. back and be like oh they do that for this reason right yeah. so yeah okay um Next question, is are there any like misconceptions about what you do? Especially this is something that was interesting as well with Stephen from him 
uh, working as an employee in the in the uh, food service industry and then becoming a manager. And you've also had those experiences of actually being an employee and trying to come up in that situation. And then now you're self-employed, you're an entrepreneur, you're in business, you're kind of controlling your own things. So are there certain things that when you became your own on uh, your own like uh, own business owner running your own company working by yourself are there things about and um, being an employee in that industry that you finally saw and you're like okay that makes sense now and also in the inverse are there things that you thought the people in the people running things the people owning things um that you thought while you were employed by them that they need to do this in a better way but now you realize might be way why they were doing certain things certain limitations that they had and I think you mentioned some of them with the legal situations where you, as an employee, you might not understand some of those legal things. So just misconceptions in general about different parts of your career in the wine industry. Um, well, somewhere where I really struggle is just sort of anything to do with administration. I'm not a very organized person and thank God for my business partner. <clears throat> He's totally autistic and like obsessed with like numbers and like, <laughs> like order. And so he'll be like, okay, you have to document this, Laura. You have to put it in the Google document. Do I need to show you how to do this? <laughs> he keeps track of all the finances and everything. I suck at that stuff. Um, and that was a big struggle for me in my past jobs, just documenting things, um, financial statements, like key performance indexes, like all that stuff. I hated it. I'm, I like to be front facing, doing the interaction, building the relationships. Like I like to be the face of the business. Um, so that was definitely something that I had disdain for, which was probably inappropriate. And <laughs> yeah, I'm very lucky that I have my partner to kind of like look after that stuff. Um, and then in terms of just like misconceptions about what I do, I hear a lot from people where they think I live this really like, I don't know, life of luxury and I'm just gallivanting around just tasting wine and they don't see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and like yeah. the really dark days where I'm like depressed and scared and anxious and there's a lot of planning that's required and just just the sheer amount of work that like building your own website managing your own social media like reaching out to people building like it's it's just endless like you have to wear so so many hats um and although i have benefited from that because it's really um developed me as a person, um, it can be really challenging at times because I'm essentially like, you know, a one woman show. And sometimes it would be nice to have like an assistant to be like, oh, can you write that blog post? Or like, you know, can you make sure like the, the website launches on time or like update this pricing structure or something like that? It's just, it all falls on me and it's, it's really challenging. And also like, I think how like successful people think that I am. <clears throat> it's like, yeah, like I make a decent living, but I'm not like a millionaire. And it's people think yeah. that I'm like so successful. And I'm like, it's weird. Like the optics of how people, yeah. other people see you, you know, and they'll reach out to you yeah. and be like, how did you do this? How did you build it? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. Like, I don't know what the hell yeah. I'm doing half the time, you know? So yeah. that's another thing I, I found funny, but I think we're all guilty of that. Like, especially people we idolize, it looks like they've yeah. got it all figured out and it couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's one of uh, somebody I met online. She she runs a a, a company that grills grills by Demont. You check that out. We'll try to get her on this series. If if it's up, if you're watching this some <laughs> months or something down. There might be a link somewhere to get to the to the one me talking to her. She just posted something where it was it's like running a business is like riding a lion. Like most people look at you and like, oh, that's brave and amazing, and then you're sitting there wondering like. How would you get a line if you're trying to get it to stop you? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's a great analogy. That's, I love that's, that. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah. Um, so anything else like misconceptions that you thought that like, okay, this is definitely something that you wish somebody had told you about the industry before you actually entered the industry? Um, that it's a lot of smoke and mirrors okay. and that it's just everyone's scared and tired and anxious and they're all just participating in this circus. And yeah, it's just a lot of, I just love your, your, your use of the term appropriating. They're just, it's a lot of people just emulating and copying and incarnating and ah, yeah, people are just scared to kind of be unique, especially in wine because it's so entrenched in like history and tradition and yeah. risk-taking is not all that commonplace. And a, a concept that my partner and I talk about a lot, especially because we've just branched out into kind of like a new area with our business um, is world building. And 
I think that people are so concerned about optics and reputation and image, and they end up trying to be everything to everybody, but then you're kind of like nothing to nobody. You don't really have like like this sense of identity. And it's like, no, the more that you really tap into like your unique kind of like superpower, which is essentially you, the more you attract those like-minded people. And then you build this, this world that maybe someone else who's like just adjacent to you, but doesn't have an interest in that, they would never know that it exists. Like, um, the world of like Dungeons and Dragons or something yeah. or like interior yeah. design or like whale fishing or anything, you know, it's like, yeah. I'm in a very niche little thing, but like, then you just kind of like build on it. It's like, like, like a simulation, you know? And it's like, it's all kind of like within your own control. And like, we're so worried mm. constantly about what other people think. And it's like, it doesn't yeah. matter what they think because if they don't resonate, yeah. they don't matter, you know? And that's, yeah. that's been the really beautiful part about working with my business partner because where he lacks maybe some social graces or emotional intelligence, I kind of like make up for that. But he's also taught me to just sort of like shed those fears, which has been so incredibly like liberating. So yeah, I'm having a lot of fun um, cool. building, building what I'm building. And I, I feel like I'm only at the beginning. Mm. So cool. Good. Yeah. That, that, that finding complimentary people is definitely, it's definitely a blessing to, to get that situation. <clears throat> and I think it goes back to what we were first talking about that, in order to find complimentary people, you got to, you have to know who you are first, because otherwise you're going to mm-hmm. partner yourself with somebody who won't compliment the things that you do or somebody you don't appreciate in that sense. And but yeah, with the world building thing, that's my primary background project. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, that's part of part of the collecting information and building worlds is seeing the different like reality tunnels people actually exist in and form and just just the confidence of being that being in that place being in that place that you're supposed to not supposed to be but you know you're supposed to be here in the sense that you've understood why the actions that you took to be there and that's what it makes you feel like there's something about the american dream that is it's a dream dreams aren't real the american reality i think is a place where due to certain things in the system in the western tradition and things like that is that ability to have the choice, that ability to choose things, it's not a pursuit of happiness, but it's actually contentment, satisfaction. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, something that is much more valuable than simple. Just, I think the idea of happiness, which is very nebulous, you can be super sad about most of the things in your life, but then you come home, you've got your kid. Like, that's happiness. Yeah. That's contentment. That's satisfaction. That, that, does, that doesn't negate all the things that are making you sad, but that satisfaction kind of supersedes all those things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> all right um so the, the next question here is you, you mentioned a lot of these already uh but just in the back in the your background and your history definitely some some of the stuff that you were working before you actually got to the position that like, position that you're in now but are there any particular things that you learned in schooling or in your childhood that you think played a big part in you being able to do what you're doing with um as a i'm saying i'm not going to say this name right a congan so a congan wine <laughs> wine um what would you what would you say the congan wine is it a congan am i saying that right i don't know what you're trying to say the word the word of location you said a congan wine coordinator right oh what uh wine consultant or wine, wine consultant, professional sorry. what was the word there was a region or something that you mentioned oh Oh, Okanagan. 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 Yes. Yeah. Sorry. That's I, it. I'll say Okanagan. I don't know why. My, my, my hand right is garbage. Okay. So what, what are some things that you learned? Was there some classes you took in some school or other things that you didn't actually, what were the things historically before you got in the field that you thought, okay, this helped that if somebody wanted to get in your field, that these were courses that would take, or they would have certain aptitudes that would kind of lean, like help them do this. And some things that maybe you missed out on that, if you knew this is where you were going to be, you'd have done a lot earlier. Well, so back when I first started my um, university degree, I was actually enrolled in a program in entrepreneurship. Okay. And I remember transferring out of it. I was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't think this applies to me. And then I ended up transferring into um, doing a BA in international relations, which I'm like, so silly looking back and all the different poli sci classes that I took and that whole indoctrination that took place. And I was fully, fully convinced I was going to go on to work for the UN and change the world. And now that's like, Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I, but I really do think that one of my biggest influences is my dad. Um, he instilled that entrepreneurial spirit within me. So 
when I was 14, he picked up our entire family and moved us across the country from Ontario to BC and opened his dental practice. And at the time, he was the only pediatric dentist in the area between Vancouver and Calgary. But he was also specializing in IV sedation and treating special needs children and also autistic children. So very niche. And when we moved there, he literally had a pile of like brochures and we drove all over the Okanagan Valley and he handed it out to every single dentist, just like send your referrals my way. And I remember having a lot of resentment towards my dad because he's like tough love, like does not mince his words, incredibly judgmental, much like myself. And I think <laughs> when you mirror someone else, you're like, I don't like you because you're a lot mm. like me. I think I mm. said that to you, Stephen, just recently. You did. I? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> but now everything that he instilled in me is exactly what I'm doing. And I just loved his fearlessness. And, you know, he would say things like, you know, you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences, you are the architect of your own reality. Um, and just, yeah, not being an apologist and just really... Having a lot of integrity, that's something that really has come back again and again and again. And not that I'm like an anti-knowledge or anti-education proponent in any capacity at all. Like I've done my whole fair share of education. For me now, though, it's a lot of self-study and talking to people and traveling and going to the source and going beyond the book knowledge because that only takes you so far. It's like a a really nice foundation, but then you have to really tap into it and really like get to like the nitty gritty. Um, so I've, I've considered like maybe like enrolling in some certain courses again, but whenever people ask me that, I'm like, unless they're like just starting out on their own journey, I'll recommend like certain certifications, like even what I've done, like I've done my wine and spirit education trust. Um, and then I started to do the diploma, but then I just kind of got halfway through and I was like, it's just too dogmatic. And it's very, it's too confined to like one sort of ideology. And it's like these ideologues just like teaching their beliefs and perpetuating a lot of these like sort of self-limiting kind of mentalities um so yeah it's it's so funny how when you come full circle when you get older and you're like oh i guess my parents were right like they Mm -hmm. they did kind of like know what they were talking about so like yeah, yeah definitely the wisdom of my parents and just um letting go of generalizations too Um, and thinking that like, you know, everything. And I think that's the true pinnacle of like, when you get into like another like level of expertise or understanding of the world or whatever, like your niche is, you kind of fall off that cliff and you have this moment of like, the more, you know, the less, you know, and then that's when the true journey starts because you tap into that like insatiable curiosity. And it's like this never ending quest for more and more knowledge. And then the world just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more overwhelming. You're like, oh, my God, I'm so irrelevant and meaningless. <laughs> but I want to know more. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not a very I mean, that's, that's, that's not like a very applicable kind of like process, but. <laughs> Some more issues here. I was talking about how people want you to perceive certain things. Some people want you to think it is. We've had a series on um, cracks in the ivory tower. And when we when people bring up objections against the current schooling indoctrination complex, people say you're against education. I'm like, no, we're not against education. No. The reason we're against the schooling indoctrination complex is because there's no education there anymore. It's yeah. not about education. They're selling you a different product. It's not actually something that's informing you. Why should education be so expensive? Why do people want to hide certain information from other people? Oh, you've got to take these prerequisites before you come do this. You have to follow this. It's like, no, people who want to learn actually enjoy learning. If you're in, if you're given access to a field of something you really want to learn from, and somebody who's able to do that thing can actually go out there and impart that knowledge onto you. I think that's, that's a, that's a kind of relationship that everyone is really, really encouraged. Like I talked about the appropriation thing. I think that's what human, that's what life is. It's just learning from past mistakes and you continue, continue, continue. And then you spread that information out. I think most people are like, how, how excited are you when somebody comes and says, this is not a wine that I want. And then you pour it for them. And then they leave thinking that you've imparted that knowledge on them. You've educated them on something new. And that process itself has been mutated in the schooling indoctrination complex in part due to state involvement and things like that. Yeah. that Stephen and I have hours <laughs> talking about that yeah. on the side, but yeah, I think that's definitely um, a good point. Of, and that's that's one of the key questions in this is to show like different ways of people to get to these things. I'm sure there's other people who are doing something similar in the field that found themselves way through different kind of areas. So it's good to see how you you got there, and then other people will find their ways if that's what they want to actually be at in, in a different mm-hmm. way. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and. Yeah. 
just to add to that, like in my own like self-admitted ignorance, I used to think that, you know, the people who were the loudest and had the most to say like, oh, they must be the smartest in the room. And then I would underestimate um, individuals who were quiet and humble and would really, really listen. It's like, no, they're the ones that really know what's going on um, because they know that they don't know a whole lot. Um, And they're the people that I look to, like there's this um, friend of mine um, in the industry, he's the VP of winemaking for a bunch of different wineries scattered throughout Canada. And he is so humble, like to a fault. And he is so unfathomably knowledgeable and has one of the best palates that I've ever encountered. And also just like the nicest guy ever. And it, it, it happens a lot where people are like, oh, I wanted to hate him because like he works for like a big conglomerate, but he's really taking them in this really cool direction. And then once I got to know him, I was like, wow, like he is incredible, but he'll never, ever wave that flag. You wouldn't know otherwise, unless someone else tells you like that is the level of like humility that I aspire to. And I don't think that I'm there yet. I think I still have a little bit of like an ego chip on my shoulder where I'm trying to get my voice heard and have, you know, I want to have the last word or like prove myself to all of the people who have like doubted me along the way, even though it doesn't really matter, but there's still that sort of like chip on my shoulder to some degree, which I don't know if it's like a female thing or just my own journey or what, but I think everybody struggles with that to some capacity because like we want to be taken seriously and garner the respect Mm. of our peers. Right. I think that that's a normal thing to desire, you know? Yeah. It matters a bit. I mean, that's definitely some things you can see where, like some people are like, oh, why does this athlete keep playing like past their prime? I'm like, if that if that athlete did have that drive in them, they would never have gotten that good to begin with to even fall from that prime. Like there's something yeah. in certain people that makes them seek higher meaning in certain fields. And that's that's why I'm thinking it's just amazing to live today. So it's really unfortunate that people are just put in this cookie cut away and shoved through this machine when there's so many different options to get to actually very productive and satisfactory places in the in in the world. And I think most of the most of the issues are from people saying, I deserve this or I should be doing this instead yeah. of saying like I can do this and I can achieve this. And this, yeah. It's, yeah. It's just, there's something messed up going on right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now <laughs> again, the most important, the most important this this whole thing has been a ruse for me to get to this question. <laughs> and this one is um, do you like cheese? And if yes, which ones and why? And if you know why you're such a horrible person. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, obviously I love cheese. Mm-hmm. Um prob- I think the the one that comes to mind for me immediately because there's such a natural and effortless pairing that goes with it is Conte. It's a a cheese that comes from um, an area in France called the Jura. And they make this very famous style of wine called Vin Jaune, which means yellow wine. And it's that color, obviously, for different reasons, but it's a process where they allow a layer of yeast to develop over top of the the must called and they call it Souvoile. Um, and it just makes this very bewitching, very unusual, but like really, um, addictive style of wine. It's, it's nutty and oxidative. And like with that cheese, which is also very like nutty in style, it's, oh my God, it's like, (laughs) it's match made in heaven. And then probably second would be, um, St. Agure blue cheese with, um, there's this, um, style of wine from, Southern France and Languedoc Roussillon, it's like a a dessert style red. And -hmm. just with like the unctuous, I can't remember. It's like a, not Van de Soif. It's, um, help me, Steven. What's the, I I know what you're, I know what you're talking about, but I'm trying to. The producer is called Rive Salt and it's just like a dessert style wine. I can't think of the name. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But, um, that with blue cheese is like to die for. And then probably lastly would be, I know you didn't ask me for three, but I'm going to give you three. I could probably give you more. No, um, oh, go ahead. We, we, go ahead. we could do another yeah. two hours. We could do another two hours on this if you want. Like, I, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Manchego. I, I just oh, yeah. love Manchego. Um, with pretty much any Spanish wine, Cava is just like an effortless pairing because it's just so quaffable. Um, goat cheese, just by, by virtue of its like earthiness pairs really, really beautifully with Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir tends to be like a really earthy kind of like style of wine as well. Mm. 
Oh my God. Like there's so many. I just, I just love cheese so that's much. A, that's interesting. <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't actually, I hadn't heard of goat cheese with Pinot Noir. I want to try that now. I typically do Pinot Noir with like pork or duck or something. I mean, it makes An sense. An amazing pairing. That. If you take like a little canapé and do uh, like a roasted beet and goat cheese and then have it with Pinot, it's so good. And it brings out all like the savory kind of like aspect. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm like a hedonist at heart. It's just like, <laughs> uh, give uh, me all the pleasure in all its various forms. <laughs> it's it's, we're, it's we're not having a, those wines up on the, on the screen as, as you're listening. So you can definitely check this out. What What is yeah. the whole pairing? You know, the historical pairing, like wine and cheese. Is it just because it has a history of like being with like royalty? It was something that people were having. Like, what is that whole wine and cheese thing together? I don't know. Do you know, Stephen? That's actually a good question. Now I feel like I should know, but it's just it's it's one of those things you just take for granted. Nobody really says. I mean, I'm probably gonna look it up now, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because I'm saying that's probably part of why people look at your job and they think like, oh, there's something about wine that's different. If you were like, okay, I mean, the in the beer industry or even the liquor industry, I think fewer people might just think that oh, this person must be wealthy. There's something about wine that has that class kind of aspect to it. I'm not I'm not yes. necessarily sure quite well. yeah it has that romanticism yeah maybe it's like it it has to do with like breaking bread at the table like it can it there's some like religious context there um it's like kind of entrenched and ingrained in like royalty there's sort of like this regal sort of umbrella and mysticism and yeah there's a whole host of different reasons for why i think Oh yeah, I'm reading here too. They say it has a lot to just do do with what's like big in those regions. So it's like you produce a certain cheese in that region, you produce a wine in that region. It was commonly okay. paired with that. But then I guess over time, people figured out, well, this this wine from this region works better with this cheese from this region, and it just sort of expanded from that. Because I think of like you think about like uh, Bordeaux, like you know the famous Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot. That's typically paired with red meat. So there's like things like that, or like yeah, um, yeah or like. In the South, you have like, you know, Provence, some of those rosés you have with like the lighter stuff. So they're just sort of adapting based on, um, you know, probably the climate and what food, what region, what um foods available in each region and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's like a very good general rule of thumb for food pairing. Yeah. It's just drink the local wine, the local food. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that makes that makes it makes sense. Um, speaking of the wine as well, this is a bit back to the, the previous question. You mentioned about things to learn, like when it comes to the palate and the tasting. Do you, is that something you can develop before? Do you feel there's there's an aspect of it that you personally or other people who, I mean, this like we said, there's capacity and there's equity and there's, there's capacity and ability where some people might just not have taste buds, but are there certain things that people can do to improve their ability to taste different kinds of wines that you've done or you've seen other people do? Oh, for sure. Like our palate and our olfactory, they're both, both muscles. So the more that you use them, the more you're going to develop the ability to assess wines, right? Um, and what I tell people all the time is smell absolutely everything, especially when you're yeah. at the grocery store, just to sort of catalog and like build yeah. your own little encyclopedia within your mind so that when you smell a certain wine where you know that Pinot Noir from like this specific region is going to smell like X, Y, Z. And like that might vary from person to person because we all have different points of reference, um, and mm -hmm. that's why I sort of like love, but I also hate tasting notes because what might be relevant to someone where they might describe it as brambleberry. And it's like, well, I don't know what brambleberry smells like, or yeah. you might in Kenya, there's probably tons of fruit that I've never smelt or tasted before. So you might describe a wine as something like that. And I might be like, I don't know what that means. Right. And so there's this been, there was this really interesting book actually that was written by an MW, a master of wine. His name is Nick Jackson called, um, I can't remember what the name of the book is actually, but he kind of turned the whole approach to tasting on its head. And instead of assessing like aromas or flavors, he talks about the wine in terms of shapes and structures. So Chenin Blanc, he describes the acidity as a crescendo. So when you're tasting blind and a lot of these exams, if the, the acid just continues to build and build and build and build and build, you're like, okay, there's a pretty good chance it might be Chenin Blanc. And then it's just like sort of that like process of deduction. And so like, I thought that was really cool. And there's a lot of people who've been in the industry, like even as long as I have or longer, and you sort of think that you've figured it all out. And so when people, um, well, you were saying that too recently, Stephen, like it's hard to come up with new ideas. So when like yeah. a new idea like that is presented, I think it's, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's transcendent. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. That actually makes my life a hell of a lot easier than just trying to figure out, oh, okay. I smelled blackberry. 
Now yeah. what? What could this be? Right. So, um, and it's just practice. Like, I still feel like a neophyte when I'm tasting wine. Most of the time, I'm like, "Am I is is what I'm tasting accurate? Am I right?" Yeah. And it's like it always comes back to just sort of like trusting your intuition and like that first thought that comes to mind. And yeah. I remember a winemaker told me ages ago. He was like, "You should know within the first like five seconds of tasting something if you like it or not. Otherwise, yeah. it's just going to be this like." Um, process of just convincing yourself that it's something that it might not be like, you're not going to find complexity where there is none and vice versa. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say, I don't know what you were taught Laura, but what the way I was taught in school with tasting wine is think of a very broad category and keep narrowing it down. So think like yeah. fruit and then like, okay, is it like berries? Is it stone fruit? Is it apple pear family? And then narrow it down from that. It's like, okay, is it like dark or red berries? Okay, dark, dark berries. Are they fresh or dry or candied? And then you just keep uh, narrowing it down from that. That helped yeah. me a lot. Cause like you start yeah. with their very broad uh, category and then you just keep narrowing. And you're like, okay, now that's, you know. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Same. Yeah. 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 Okay. One last on this food, food topic. Is there any... Why is wine grapes? Like, why not other fruits or other fruits to make wine? Like, why is it like, I know like potatoes, it's like vodka. Okay. But can you make vodka out of other, other tubers? So with wine, is there other things where you think like, okay, this is competitive enough to what typical wine with grapes is, but it's not made out of grapes, something else entirely. I mean, I've tried a whole host of different types of fruit wine, but I don't know, maybe because people just haven't excelled at it or devoted enough time or investment into really like honing it into something that's um worthwhile taking notice of mm -hmm. but personally no i just i don't know maybe it, it goes back to that romanticism and that mysticism about planting vines and yeah i, I mean I, like i've tried all like cherry wine and blueberry wine and all that but you just i think it's like the clusters and the stems and the seeds and like it's all these different sort of components at play that make this very magical product and i don't know i probably sound like i'm in a cult or something but yeah i don't know i've i've tried so many fruit wines that are just gross and i just i'm not convinced that they could bear the same result that grapes can for whatever reason it's another I, thing I that think, i need to look up now too <laughs> i think i think it might just be the composition of the fruit like maybe because like the tannins like i mean i know tannins are in other things too but maybe like a certain percentage of sugar to tannin ratio um i'm trying to think of what else I'm trying to think of like what else you would say, but like, like there's certain characteristics about the fruit itself that I think makes it better. That's why I can't yeah. remember all the terms off the top of my head, but yeah. Because yeah, and all the sheer the, varieties of grapes as yeah. well, too. Yeah, yeah. Because we're, we're, we, we've had these conversations, Stephen, talking about cheese. We, we really like cheese. We're talking about like different kinds of cheese. There's a lactose, and like cheese for people who are lactose, um, um, lactose intolerant. intolerant. Like, yeah, lactose intolerant. Like, they have the type A milk, milk where they take out some aspect of the milk, the lactase in that. So there might be ways to do that. And they also have the impossible meats and things like that we're getting soon to the point where we'll have like replicators where technically you might be able to just get basic elements of things and then we combine them into whatever wine is so there'll be ways to ostensibly take out the actual grape aspect and insert whatever you want into there so that's just something that um, that's kind of interesting to why certain foods come together in certain ways and why others can't do that same kind of thing uh, sure. I was just gonna say, Laura is also a very big fan of Mortadella. If you follow her page, you'll see her posting a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll do that. We'll have the links there below. Are you that. on Instagram, Silas? Yeah, yeah, it's Anima Soli. So I'll send you a link. While we're still on the topic, what's the wine that you're drinking? Oh, so this is from Prince Edward County, which is mm. about three hours, kind of like northeast of Toronto. Um, and like I said, it. it it, it's kind of like this little island that is like a bedrock of limestone with like very specific little hot, hot pockets that they can ripen certain varieties. And this is owned by a mother daughter team. Mm. And okay. they have had, I think like something in the neighborhood of like a hundred acres in their family for several generations now by, um, and they are able to kind of leave some of the land fallow, which draws away certain pests or predators. Um, so they're, they're farming as holistically as they can. And then they're just doing a lot of like fun and funky stuff. So this is actually a blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, and so to some people that might come across as weird, it's not that weird, but, um, like champagne is a blend of white and red varieties as well. Yeah. Um, which maybe like, uh, an, a newbie would not know. Um, and yeah, it's just very, um, it's very savory. 
Um, and what I've kind of like come to learn in my journey now that I've been tasting wine for as long as I have, um, I really just want to taste the fruit. And a lot of wine is masked through the use of oak and various additives and, you know, just to create that homogenous product along the, along the lines of what I was talking about earlier. But yeah, I just want to taste like what that fruit presents itself as from that specific area. Um, and yeah. you just really seek, seek out like purity and like simplicity. And so this with like cheese or mortadella, obviously, um, <laughs> but something like, tomato based because it's so savory like it reminds me of almost like ketchup chips or something like mm. i was eating those you know those like oversized like italian beans that are like marinated in like the italian sauce or uh, tomato yeah. sauce yeah um i actually was serving this wine with those last night and it was just like a match made in heaven because it's there's like like almost like a tomato leaf vibe but then also like an <laughs> orange zest thing kind of like going on and yeah wow. it's just really interesting so yeah that's what i'm drinking cool yeah. Anything else with the cheese, Stephen? Um, no. I mean, that, again, that could be a whole discussion in of itself. But it's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, good answer. Okay, though. So now on to the last question of the main ones before we get to the last three. And again, thank you very, very much for this. It's been an excellent conversation. Um, is there anything else you want to add about this? Like with like what you do, like the earnings, cost benefit analysis, trade offs. One of the questions we like asking here are. In relationships like you mentioned you've met people in the industry and i think that's in part uh due to i think you liking something that you're doing you're probably going to meet people who chose to do that as well and find some kind of appreciation in it but just uh maybe cost benefit analyses with relationships like do you how often do you actually interact with people what are things that you think you've lost out on or you've traded off on because of the things that you do you can't also do these other things um, I mean, definitely what I do, it's, it's, um, lifestyle first and foremost. Um, I, I, I'm trading off for probably a better paying role elsewhere for some six figure marketing job with some big like wine corporation. Um, but I, yeah, I would not trade what I do for anything. Cause it's like what I, what I have that a lot of people don't is time, time to yeah. build those relationships. Like that would be the number one thing that I do is interact with people. I'm very accessible. Um, and I, I want to be because I want to learn from my followers and try and garner understanding for like what they're about. And that attitude has really shifted for me um, as of late, where I used to sort of like maybe I was a bit arrogant or positioned myself as like above other people. And it's like, no, it's like I can learn just as much from the consumers that I pour wine for or the followers who reach out to me on Instagram just as much as they can learn from me and make it this just exchange of information. And uh, it's, yeah, it's become this this thing that I'm on like this perpetual quest for. Um, and yeah, sometimes I would obviously love to like make more money, but that's, that's all up to me as well. Like I'm definitely a procrastinator. I'm prone to laziness. Um, but even within that, I'm very, very lucky. Like even when I was going to BC, my boyfriend was like, Oh, to live the life of Laura, like just gallivanting <laughs> around. Like I'm very lucky, like the lifestyle that I get to live. Um, obviously I want to travel again. Um, and that's going to be like, you know, subject to like what the hell goes on with COVID and everything like that. I really yeah. miss traveling. Oh, that was uh, something that I just loved doing. Like right before COVID, like in 2019, I went to India for two months. And then like a couple months later, I was in Slovenia and Northern Italy and then moved to Toronto and I was going all over Niagara. And it was just, it was one of the most transformative years, like of my life, like the people that you meet and the things that you learn and the th the food you get to eat and the wines you get to taste. And it just, it enriches your soul. Like, oh, I just love traveling so much. And it sounds like such a lame, like basic bitch thing to say, but it's like, I'm not going to like, you know, an all-inclusive in Mexico or something like that. I'm going to like weird places that most people would not go yeah. to like really learn and garner understanding. And yeah, I, along the, you're, you're along the lines of like what you were saying earlier, Silas, about like globalization. Like, yeah, it's, I don't like that the world is going in that direction because I think that we really need to preserve like local traditions and history and stuff like that. But it's really cool to go and be like a witness of how other people live their lives. So that was, a, that was another big tangent. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, getting to the end of this, but still some connection issues. So right here, I was just making the case for communication is a key thing. Understanding people is a key thing. So when someone says, I want to have at least one language, that says nothing about other languages, but it's good to have at least one that you can communicate across, like you can have some kind of understanding with. I think that's 
that's that's part of why I'm seeing with with the whole globalization aspect. Yeah. yeah. And one question you you'd mentioned something at the at the start of something we see you're talking about going back to the traveling. You said there was a, a law when you're talking about the the liquor systems. You said it was C number something, and I was just thinking about other laws that I was hearing coming out in Canada. Is that a category or something? What does the C stand for? Like, is that just how laws in in, uh, in Canada? Are uh, Bill Bill C ninety one. I don't know what the C stands for. I'll I'll look that up and let you know. Okay, yeah, maybe it's like okay. So, um, anything else, Stephen? You got any other questions? Um, no, I was going to say what you said about traveling. It reminded me a bit of what Jacqueline said uh, last time, and of course that that interview will be up soon, where she talked a lot about how. She travels a lot and people think, oh, what do you made of money? And she made the point that you don't you can travel to these places. You don't have to stay in five star resorts. You just have to be creative in where you go, yeah. like where you stay, what kind of food you eat, all that. It is doable. And I've been thinking about that, too, because, I mean, I, I haven't traveled. I mean, I've never left the U.S. because for me, more it was it was more of a financial thing before. Now I'm in much better situation but it's also with covid but like i'm starting to think about that now too because i want to travel as well but it's like i'm not looking to stay in like the top hotel in switzerland or something like that it's just like even if i have the money it's like i'd rather see each place a bit and like live kind of modestly and just like see more rather than go to one place and just go all out that's how i see it anyway Uh, absolutely totally agree yeah yeah, and I think it's, it, it definitely seems that the field that you're in, you're saying the cost benefit analyses, it's, so it seems to be a field where at least the people that you interact with on a day-to-day basis while you're doing your work, it seems like there'd be very few people who are doing that because it's just what they do. It's what they feel they have to do. It seems to be that most of the people in there are doing it because they chose to do this and they have like some affinity or they, they, it's more than just something to pay the bills. As many fields, unfortunately, people just find I'm doing this because it's what I do to pay the bills, or I'm doing this just because it's it's the only thing I can do. It seems to me a lot of people are in there by choice more so than in many other fields. Is is that something that you've noticed? Uh yes and no. I think that definitely exists for maybe people who are doing similar things to me. Definitely the case for winemakers, because I I find with a lot of winemakers, it's like their second career or third career after they've finally retired, like, okay, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. It's like slowly killing my soul. And then they kind of like land in this position because they want to work outdoors <laughs> and create a product that is like really meaningful to them. Whereas like other people I know who maybe have worked in restaurants for their whole life, it's just sort of like a natural progression where it takes a toll on your body and it's so stressful and toxic. And yeah. so then they're like, oh, okay, instead of being a SOM on the floor of a restaurant, maybe I'll be a sales rep now. And then maybe some other opportunity will present itself. And then they just sort of like meander through the web of like available positions in the wine industry. But it's, it's definitely a love hate thing. Like there's a lot of people that maybe who aren't as tenacious or have as thick of skin as some of us where they're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I have like post-traumatic stress disorder from like working in the wine industry. And it's like, but you could say the same for any other industry. You know what I mean? It's all just a matter of who you choose to surround yourself with. And if you want to participate in the toxicity, then yeah, fill your boots. But I just choose not to. And I mean, I still have to deal with bullshit, but whatever. It's just water off a duck's back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And also the victimhood mentality too, where like I have so many female friends and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm subject to misogyny and oh, they didn't buy this wine because I'm a woman. I'm like, no, <laughs> maybe they, maybe they just don't like you. Like maybe it has nothing to do with the fact that you have a vagina. Have you ever considered that? Like. It's, it's, it's possible. <laughs> it's a uh... possibility. But- well, apparently, no, that, that never occurs to them. It's, yeah, exactly. Oh, the patriarchy. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> don't say it's, that it's, to me. It's, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. it's fantastic. I mean, people really imagine that like, we, like any mammal that's created like we are could not could exist without being gynocentric. It's it's just not it's neither here nor there. It's just not. not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're all on the same page here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Steven, anything else on this last one? Um, no, I think I covered a lot of stuff. So I think that's all good. Yeah. So that's it for the actual main questionnaire, Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, um, I think we'll just jump into the last three. These ones are something that will expand and get to be more fruitful. And we shall probably get you back with one of these later as we get to that. But the first one is, do you have any questions for us about the, about what you've talked about that you thought, or maybe these things we might have been wondering about, or just in general, just questions about this topic? Yeah, I was wondering what you do, Silas. Oh, I 
<laughs> right now, my background is, is like in graphic design and animation. And um, most of the time, the last couple of years, I've just been working on creating content, doing art. So freelance design, graphic design, and I'm in the process of starting a company with a friend of mine. Steven's going to be part of that as well. I'm just creating content, working on stories. The company in general, it's an idea that I've had in mind for a long time is like world building in a sense of doing like cloud storytelling. And I have my friend Derek on. He's going to come on with one of these. So depending on when you listen to this, there'll be more with that in particular. But professionally, it's just graphic design, freelance design, animation, um, writing, things like that. So that's been what I've been doing in my free time, like professionally wise. And then otherwise, just thinking, reading, consuming things, creating content, having long conversations with Steve online. And um, this itself, this I Know Great People is one of the core projects that I think will be in there. It's just getting people together, sourcing information from other people, just being, it's a bit selfish for me because I'm just an information and an infoholic. So having these conversations, just taking in more and more things. And then the more ideas I get from people, it helps me also create and uh, communicate mm -hmm. and do other things in other aspects. So that's just been part of, of what I, what I do. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Any questions for Steven? Uh, I mean, I talk to Steven every day, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next question is the last three is, um, do you have any other questions for anybody else that might participate in this actual series? And this is also part of the following question was, if you have someone in particular that you're interested in, some kind of job or some kind of field or some kind of pastime that you're personally interested in that you'd want to ask them, because if we get like that person on, let's say you like bull riding and you have a question for a bull rider, you can ask us that here. And then if that bull rider comes on, we can like, oh, Laura asked the question. And then we can give it to him or just any other questions in general. You don't have to give them all now. Whenever you want to give them and put it to, uh, give it to us, we'll keep it in the database and then we'll ask those to people as they come on. So, yeah. Okay. I do have one and I posed this to Stephen the other night. Um, and it's a little psychological exercise that um, tells you a little bit about the person when they answer. So my business partner asked me this the other day. He was like, what trait or whatever characteristic or whatever um, do you hate about like humanity or society? And then whatever answer people give you um, is generally what they hate most about themselves. And I thought that that was so profound. And so I've been asking so many people about that. And you tell them after they answer and they're like shaking in their boots. They're like, whoa, like, <laughs> oh my God, I have some introspection and self-discovery to do. Um, and it's it's a really kind of like fun exercise to do with people. So that would be cool to kind of like put someone on the spot, whoever, whomever your next guest happens to be. I don't know yeah. if that would be relevant to like what you're doing, but. No, yeah. it's relevant because the next question is, uh, would you like to take a random or requested question? And we'll add that to one of the random questions. Like if now somebody had some question about wine and that was part of the requested questions with that question, if you'd picked random or requested, we'd have given you the requested question about wine. And if you had picked random, then the question you just gave us would be probably considered more like a random that's not necessarily on topic. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Oh, so I can pick a rant. Wait, random or requested? What does that mean? Requested? Requested would be like, let's say if you had a particular question for, the, if somebody had asked a particular question about the wine industry or about Canadian wines oh. for some reason, then in this third part, and this is, this is a third of the last three questions, is asking you after you've given your question, if you'd like to take a random question from the database that we're building or 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 I requested questions. So that's the kind of situation there. Oh, okay. And, um I yeah. want to say random. We don't have any so far. Oh, okay. But since you say random, once we build some up, we will come back and get you at least just for that and just that random question itself. And maybe we can talk about okay. other things around there. But yeah. since right now you're the third person who's done this with us. And it's, it's been amazing <laughs> so far. I'm really excited about this and really thankful for Stephen for having many conversations with me, but coming along with me on this personal project that I've been thinking about for some time. And he's actually provided two people as the first two people. It's been him and then two people he knows. And one of the things that I've noticed here is like the whole, I know great people. Like if you truly know somebody, you're comfortable yourself and you know, they know you for who you are then you can be comfortable in meeting somebody that they know that you've never talked to before and you can still have a good conversation because you understand what works with this person and chances are if that person has something that works with somebody else, you're going to find some kind of connection with that. And then technically, if you go far enough, isn't everybody kind of a few people away from somebody else? So 
Yeah. I think that's part of, of what I think I'm enjoying with this with this series. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, I I had no doubts that I was gonna enjoy talking to you. So yeah. <laughs> thanks. Definitely feel it's been mutual. Stephen, anything else to say? No, I mean, it's been a great talk. I mean, thank you, Laura, for coming on. I'm glad we were able to coordinate with the time zone differences. Wasn't as bad with Jack as with Jacqueline, where she's in yeah. Taiwan and then I'm here. And yeah, it was 9 a.m. there, 9 p.m. there, and like what, 4 a.m. for you? But uh, oh my God. But we're, we're, we're trying to be flexible and accommodating. Fortunately, Laura and I are in the same time zone, but we're trying to be accommodating too. And I mean, if I have to wake up early at one point or whatever I can, but I mean, we're lucky. We live in an era where we can connect with all these people across the internet. So, Let's yeah. talk to everyone we can. And I, I really enjoyed the discussion. I'm glad you and Silas got to speak. And hopefully you can be on for future discussions. It would be, be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank, well, thanks for having me. And thanks for even, yeah. like, wanting to have me on yeah. here. It's, uh, it was great. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, guys, gals, and everything else in between who are listening, if you have any particular questions about wine, about what Laura has talked about, I think, Laura, you'd be open to, in some way, shape, or form, answering. It might just be on might be right written or we might if there's enough questions we might bring her back on to field those questions and talk about that whether it's sure. on this topic or with other topics like if she comes yeah. on to talk about a different topic a different aspect of her life and she takes requires a <laughs> selects a requested question we might sneak put one of those questions in there in that kind of situation and also some of the people she mentioned in this series of things that were mentioned if you listen to this long enough down this whole project they will probably be linked somewhere below to jobs or people that have been mentioned in this actual conversation and you'll get to see the connections and maybe you listening right now might eventually be one of the people who comes on the show and you might be interviewed by Laura or any one of us in this kind of situation. Yeah. That's how this project is hopefully going to grow into, which I'm relatively confident that it, it should be, it should be able to get there. Yeah, yeah definitely. absolutely. Cool. cool. All right. All right. Well, so thanks I again. Think, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for me. But guys, you. guys, anything else in between? Goodbye. Goodbye.